Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Worcester School Committee meeting, and uh, we're going to start with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. Here. Mr. Foley? Here. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Here. Ms. Sokolanovic? Here. And Mayor Petty? Here. Okay, the first time is to consider the approval of the minutes of the school committee meeting on Thursday, June 17th, and June 30th collectively. Approve on the roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor-Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Next item is uh, report to the superintendent. Before we do that, I know Sean Sweeney is on the, uh, is he on the line? I guess. So maybe motion to suspend the rules to go to uh, response from the legal counsels to request the report on the authority to mandate COVID-19 vaccinations for 21-22 year as provided under state law for public school employees and school students. So, uh, so motion to suspend the rules, roll call to suspend the rules. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor-Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Okay. Um, so, that, so we're on that item. 1-137.1. On Does anybody have any questions on it? Uh, Ms. Novick, that was your item. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't, as it happens, have any questions on it. Um, as I remarked um, to both of our legal counsels who responded um, offline, that I appreciated the thoroughness of their responses. Um, obviously, this is an active conversation. As I suspect some of my colleagues saw, uh, the National School Boards Association also came out with further guidance um, yesterday. What I did note, though, Mr. Chair, is that um, the authority of the school committee, first of all, is fairly extensive under um, ma both Mass General Law and under the case law um, that was cited, but that the authority is both strengthened and somewhat held jointly um, with the Board of Health. Um, now, we in the city, honestly, because we're so well served by the medical community, have had limited interactions with our Board of Health, but it is quite explicitly the Board of Health that has the legal authority locally, um, looking at the case law, looking at what was presented, um, both by Attorney Tobin and by Attorney Sweeney. And so my proposal, Mr. Chair, is that we, as a school committee, um, sometime in the next two weeks, I know that there's um, probably gonna need to be another meeting that we'll have to have before we talk about next back to school. Um, I would propose, Mr. Chair, that before we have that meeting, that the school committee meet jointly with the Board of Health to have exactly this conversation, and quite possibly also to have a conversation around masking as it may be something that is a local authority question as well. So my motion, Mr. Chair, is for the school committee in the next two weeks to meet jointly with the Board of Health prior to whatever meeting the superintendent needs us to have um, for us to discuss back to school measures. You want us to, we can just have the Board of Health come into a meeting. I mean, yeah, well, we would, I, we would want to arrange for a joint meeting. I mean, they're a public board as well, and it would want to, we'd want to make sure it was posted on both sides. We just ask Dr. Hirsch to come in. And I beg your pardon? We can just ask Dr. Hirsch to No, come. that's actually the, the point. If you let, if you read the legal counsel very carefully, we, we've been relying on Dr. Hirsch, and I have no objection to that, but it's the Board of Health that actually holds legal authority under the decisions that have been made in the past regarding things like vaccinations and other health measures. Um, so, again, this is not in any way to denigrate both the Department of Public Health or any of the doctors that work there. It simply is that the legal case law makes it clear that it's actually the Board of Health that holds authority. That's correct. So, that would be, that, that is why I make the proposal that I do. So, I'm going to try to schedule a meeting? Schedule a meeting session. prior to whatever meeting that I'm sure the administration will need for us to talk about back to school measures. Yes. Oh, people ready to vote this? I don't know, but uh, we can have. I mean, we, need, we would need a quorum of us and a quorum of them. That's actually not that many people. I think probably we can manage, particularly given the ongoing okay. powers to meet remotely if necessary. Can we get a written opinion from them and just have them come back with something for the I meeting? think we probably should deliberate with both bodies. I think that that probably, we, may, we probably want to share the, the information that we have with them to make sure that they're as informed as we are. I guess. Does everybody want some meeting? Or, um, Ms. Bean Carrier? I certainly appreciate anyone who has done any research in reference to this, but we are in July. We are looking at three or four weeks. We have some major decision to make as far as mask wearing, as far as six feet, three feet, two feet. I would appreciate um, Sean giving us the information legal opinion, certainly. Also a legal opinion on what we need to make a decision on and what is being decided for us. I would like a legal opinion as far as that's concerned. As far as having an, any additional meetings, um, I'm sure we can work around people's schedules and so on, whether they're Zooming or coming in person. Do Zoom. um, but I would like to get uh, weekly updates on this process due to the fact that uh, summer goes by very quickly and we all have extremely busy schedules. However, I feel as though the legal opinion is more absolutely necessary to move forward with this. Okay. Thank you. So we'll, so we'll get the opinion and we'll get the... Uh, we have. You can schedule those meetings? Yeah, we'll do it. Oh, we have the legal opinion, yeah. Do we, so can we schedule the meetings then? And, okay, Mr. Foley? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I support the idea. I, I'm getting more and more concerned as we see what's happening across our country with the, the spread of the Delta variant. And 
um, having a conversation with the Board of Health. And, and I'd, I'd love to see Dr. Hirsch and Dr. Castile be present as well to give us their feedback. And I, th you know, I think we're looking at issues relative to vaccinations, looking at issues relative to mask wearing and some of the distancing. And I, I think it's an ever-changing, unfortunately, an ever-changing time right now as the, the variant is growing. So I think we would, we would benefit, and, and I'll just let the public know, it, it wouldn't surprise me if we're making a decision sometime mid-August or even third week of August about something in the school year that may be at the last minute because of what's changing in, in the country still. Thank you. I have the clerk figure out how she's going to schedule those meetings and contact everybody on the dates. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Superintendent. Um, through the chair. Um, also, Jesse is uh, supposed to also give us guidance. Uh, the timeline is sometime between the first two weeks in August uh, for them also to issue that guidance uh, regarding mandatory, you know, vaccinations, mask wearing, and social distancing. My, my only concern um, about the mandatory vaccinations is um, where um, it's been very clear from the commissioner there is no remote learning next year. If we exclude students because of vaccinations, then how do they get their education? I guess that will be part of that conversation we will have uh, when these two groups get together. Okay, maybe we can try to schedule it probably. I know it would be a little cramped for time, but after Desi comes up with his recommendations about the same time, it would be helpful if we can. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I, first of all, I, I saw the same information that the superintendent did and was crossing my fingers. And then, of course, the governor was asked today if there was a plan for further guidance, and he said no, um, which I think there may be a little bit of interdepartmental tussling going on, um, maybe. But um, we probably don't want to schedule around DESE, um, given what we know. Yep. Okay, we try to schedule those meetings. Okay. Do we, with DESE or without? Well, uh, let's see what I figured. We would say the second, first or second week of August. So maybe try to do the second week of August. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we can file that. Uh, what's that? Yeah, I think we're all set. So I think Paige and. Sean, we don't need them any longer until executive session. Okay. Okay. So we'll file that. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Thank you. Um, I guess I have to make, do I make that in a motion form that I would like a legal opinion prior to making any meetings or making any yeah, decisions we'll on what we need we to do? Going. Yep. Okay, so that would be a, a motion okay. that I would make to make sure that we have all the legal opinions prior to walking in the door. If there's any more to be had. Yep, okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Those in favor? Opposed? So ordered. Okay, we have the superintendent's reformative uh, report based on her goals in mid-cycle. Mid Madam Superintendent. Okay, um, very pleased to present the mid-cycle goal review. Uh, before I start, I, I do want to share that uh, this has been quite a year for everybody, and uh, we only got through the year because of the training and the collaboration with the principals in the schools. Some of them are, are here tonight, so I want to make sure that we recognize and thank all the principals as well as the teachers in every school that they worked 
endlessly uh, to work with remote learning, something that none of us had had any experience with. And I want to thank the parents. Uh, many of them joined the classrooms and were part of the instruction also. And I want to uh, thank my team. Uh, they really were working some days um, 12 hours a day, uh, putting together a remote school. So building, it's like building a regular school with brick and mortar, but doing it virtually. And there were skills that all of us uh, needed to learn to do that. And what really did come out of that is a very collaborative structure, uh, both for the principals and the district office, and also between parents and their students and the teachers. So uh, with that, I'm proud to present to you our mid-cycle goal review. So uh, as you know, um, the cycle for the superintendent's goal review um, is a cycle that is put together by DESE. Uh, we started at self-assessment in the fall of last year, the analysis, goal setting, and plan development. Uh, we then implemented the plan. We're at the mid-cycle review, and the summative uh, would be sometime in December. So in the standards and indicators for effective administrative leadership, these are uh, a different way than what we have done it before. In the past, uh, we had to address all the indicators and the standards. And with the new superintendent's evaluation, uh, you're allowed to pick one or two indicators uh, in the standards, and they have to be aligned to your goals. So there are four standards, uh, very similar to what is in the principal's evaluation, and similar in some areas with um, instruction, family community engagement, and professional culture in the teacher's evaluation process. So under instructional leadership, uh, the two areas that I connected to my goals are uh, 1B instruction and 1E data-informed decision-making. From management operations to B, HR management and development, and to E, fiscal systems. And under family and community engagement, uh, the whole part about engagement, 3A and 3C on communication. And then also on professional culture, cultural proficiency, which is 4B, and 4D, continuous learning. So I'll be addressing um, how those were done uh, in my goals. So in the human resource management and development, um, as you can read what that means, I um, rated myself proficient. And in the fiscal systems, I uh, rated myself proficient. And uh, management operations, the overall rating uh, proficient. Oh, do we skip some? Let's see. Okay, now these are the um, goals that we had uh, approved on December 3rd. Uh, the first is the student learning goal. As you can see, the focus indicators are in there. Uh, the goal was 50% of students in grades 4, 5, and 6 that participated in the fall star baseline math assessment will achieve an SGP of 40 or higher by June 2021. Um, that goal we did not meet. Uh, we met it only for grade six, and we did not meet it for grades four and five. So mid-year, we are still progressing on that goal. The professional practice goal, and again, you can see the indicators in there, uh, through the 2021 school year, create a school and district community environment that promotes two-way communication with families and provides resources for effective student learning and performance we exceeded that. And I'll give you the evidence um, later on in this conversation. Uh, the district improvement goal one, uh, increased diversity of new hires to 17% by June 2021, 
and continue to improve both the recruitment and retention rate of diverse staff. We met that goal. The district improvement goal two, to develop an initial, uh, sorry, an annual budget that is aligned with the strategic plan. We did do that, uh, participated in a lot of budget meetings and exceeded that. Uh, district goal three, lower the out of school suspension rate by 5% for special education group C students with emotional disabilities using evidence-based targeted interventions and resources by June 2021 and exceeded that. The indicator for instruction, um, you can all uh, read what that requires, uh, proficient in that, uh, the indicator for data informed decision making, also proficient, so the overall rating for standard one, instructional leadership proficient. The goals on engagement um, is also proficient and communication uh, exceeded. So the overall rating for standard three, family and community engagement proficient. Cultural proficiency, uh, proficient. Continuous learning, proficient. Overall rating for professional culture, proficient. And now I'm going to um, go to the link to the evidence uh, to show the evidence of all of those goals. Okay. So the first professional goal again is create a school and district community environment that promotes two-way communication with families provides resources for effective student learning and performance. The benchmarks that we agreed on uh, were listed in the middle column, expand family support for remote learning, technology, literacy, and access by, providing multilingual print and video tutorials of digital learning tools, conducting live multilingual technology demonstrations and webinars, offering webinars on curriculum tools and resources, providing digital drop-in and call-in hours for families and hosting on-site technology drop-ins, collaborating with community groups and holding technology training sessions for community caregivers, continue to revise and add to caregivers' tech academy website and monitor connectivity and device access. So if you click on the data link, okay, um, this is, this is the goal. So here is the data. 22 support videos were created. 11 videos were translated into 11 languages. Seven videos did not need audio. Uh, this was all available for support through our Caregivers Academy online. Uh, 5,020 hotspots were available to homes and shelters. 2,323 pre-K. Uh, which was 794 in the pre-K and kindergarten, 1529. Students were given one-to-one -one iPads by their school of enrollment and supported. 21,663 students in grades one through 12, which included transition and new citizen young adult, were one-to-one. -one. Chromebooks were distributed by their school or their program of enrollment and they were supported. Staff were in contact with families also to support technology access issues. On the multilingual virtual sessions for caregivers, uh, 209 unique forums and webinars were developed, offered to support families and caregivers in 12 months. So that started July 2020 and went to June 21. We held four public forums with the school committee also. Uh, we had interpretation available July 2020 through April 2021. 66 additional district level public forums with interpretations available were held addressing transitions, special needs, and technology support. We held four Worcester Public School District Spanish forums. 135 plus building based virtual information systems were offered at 45 Worcester Public School buildings and programs. 
family engagement events, 225 plus unique family engagement opportunities we offered in 10 months from September to June. Examples were our site councils, our parent teacher groups, our LPAC, our special ed PAC, student recognition, school-based celebrations, and community building events. Family and community questions were placed on the website. We answered them daily and responded to by appropriate staff. 97 staff questions were submitted online and we also responded to them. 202 medical flooring reopening questions were submitted and we also um, answered those. The superintendent, myself, organized and participated in 461 plus meetings with the community and agencies to share information and coordinate support for our students and families in the city. This is, I'm just gonna show you a few links uh, to the video so you can see an example, because I know people watching uh, may not have seen this information. So this is an example of our Caregivers Technology Academy site videos. Here are all the videos, and then here's all the languages uh, that we translated in so that our caregivers, which could have been parents, grandparents, anyone that was taking care of our students, had access to how to teach their child, how to know how to use Chromebooks, how to know how to use the internet, how to, how to use our app, such as Seesaw, how to get technology support, and also video conferencing. We had several caregivers technology uh, webinars. This is an example. We had drop-in sessions. We had recorded webinars. I give you some examples of those here. Uh, so if you uh, wanted to go look at them, there's a curriculum overview series. There's a gender for students. Um, there's a math curriculum overview. Uh, we're also training our, our caregivers and our staff if you wanted to know how to use the Google Calendar. There are a lot of training resources that were developed. Our, our teachers really liked our training resources, and this is the quick links. Um, you can see um, there is site by language. Uh, we taught people how to use Clever, how to use the Google Classroom, how to use iPads, how to use Seesaw, how to use Meet. Uh, we did it in all languages. We also have a transla translation line and we also use the YouTube channel. I, I think it's important for me to also share that none of this was developed. When, when, when we closed school on March 12, 2020, everything I'm showing you did not, not exist. And it's what this development of this with everybody working together and everyone learning together and, and really pushing uh, that as we have to learn this as what got us through this last year. So here's some data points for you. So the total number of sessions uh, were 55. Uh, total number of webinars, eight. So this shows us the, you know, the site. Um, how often did somebody hit the site? Uh, so we were able to tell, are people using this site? Is this valuable? So uh, total number of attendees, for example, at this time was 283. And we also had chats. So we monitored the data to make sure that the, you know, the sites were being useful and um, that if there was something else that we needed to do to improve that. Uh, we also, um, Nellie Mae grant, we wrote the Nellie Mae grant and we received it for expansion of languages. Uh, we continue to add resources in creating school toolkit. Uh, as an aside, yesterday we had a phone call from uh, Nellie May uh, to check to see what we were doing with the grant, and uh, they told us they were impressed with the work that Worcester has done regarding expansion of languages and the use of technology. So there is some uh, family engagement data now, still on the same goal that I'd like to share with you. 
So this list that I'm showing you here, I'm gonna make it a little bigger, uh, is what we did for all schools and programs and then what we did in just secondary schools and also what we did in the elementary school. So I'll leave um, this up for you to look at uh, for, for a second. I can make it a little larger if you need to see that. Uh, the work regarding family engagement uh, was, we, I already thought we did you know, a great job with family engagement and now with, with the pandemic and having to reach everybody virtually, uh, we really ramped up that work. So this is um, for the all schools and then all secondary schools and then all elementary. Also, um, I know the school committee is always interesting in our site councils meeting in our schools, uh, what is being done in site councils. So I also included here a list of all the site councils uh, in all our schools, um, how many unique visits their website had, uh, what was the information that they talked about, and you can um, see that we have our, all our schools here added here as to what happened uh, with engaging and connecting with our families uh, during this most difficult year. So also, uh, we, we uh, the answers on the parent community online, uh, there were 2,424 online questions with a translation function that were asked for us and we answered them. Um, I want to give you a sample of what the parent, Spanish parent forums look like. So there was one on 811, 1028, and 222. Uh, here is a copy of the brochure that was developed. Uh, we distributed it. It was also distributed uh, by our community partners. And of course, we had translations at uh, each of those forums. Uh, it was important uh, that we also translate, um, you know, McKinley Vento family letter. Uh, even though we were virtual, uh, remote most of the time, it was really important that we made sure that our families you know, had connections to uh, information about homelessness, uh, information about scattered sites, information about being doubled up, uh, information about where they could get food. And so uh, this is a letter that uh, went out from uh, Mara Mahoney's office, and this was translated also into the eight languages. Uh, Con Melendez, uh, did a lot of work with the, um, the LPAC. Um, it actually launched in the 1819 school year uh, by the Office of English Language Programs. And this is just an example of um, the work that was done by the LPAC. There were community partner quarterly meetings. Uh, there was um, virtual information sessions that were held and uh, we use an asset-based approach uh, to build relationships with our families um, so that we would know their strengths, we would know their stories, we were creating a welcoming environment. And this, we also did this for, for all families. And this is an example of our spring flyer that we did this spring. Uh, this is translated into English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Thuy, Arabic, Albanian, Portuguese, and um, Nepali. Let me see if I can get it. Let's see here. So that is, this, this is uh, English Learner Parent Advisory Council, LPAC. Uh, they meet the second Tuesday of each month. Uh, these are the dates they met. And uh, we, wanna, we want to expand their, their leadership skills also online. So training modules were also developed for our families and then you could uh, register to attend. And that, that was all held virtually. We also supported our families 
uh, in the virtual world. So this is the multilingual family engagement strategies that we used. So we use, as I already spoke to you about, the Caregivers Technology Academy. We had drop-in sessions. They were in person and online. We had community partner training and feedback. Uh, we provided training to PPAL, to YMCA and YWCA. Uh, we also uh, developed caregivers caregivers school-based toolkits. Uh, we provided assistance. Uh, we did purchase Google Voice uh, so that our teachers could speak to their families and to their parents. Uh, as you know, we had a hotspot program and we also, uh, thanks for uh, working with the city manager and the mayor, uh, were able to get spectrum-free internet program for those families. Uh, also very unique, is that uh, we also created an orientation video for Claremont Academy. It is on here if you're interested in looking at it at some other time. Uh, we also did an overview video on Go to Matrix. Uh, we have very multilingual video tutorials and information, and we made sure that they were organized by quick links. And also, uh, we developed that parent portal so that parents were able to get access to bus changes, uh, scheduling changes. As you know, we did many schedule changes due to changing from um, remote to hybrid to finally uh, in person. Now, uh, special education families, we wanted to make sure that we did extra out outreach to them. So this is an example of our special education department. We held information um, sessions on dyslexia and language-based disabilities on February 12th, on April 14th, and on, also on January 12th. We also uh, held a virtual celebration of our, our kids in Jerry Roach's program, uh, the transition program, and um, we also, so we celebrated special education success in their story, and we did that also virtually. There were some, we sent newsletters home to parents. Uh, the L newsletter is called Voices. Uh, you can see that it's right here. It's, this is the first one we sent November 2020. Um, the subject is which voices will be heard. Uh, we gave information about WIDA, the eSummit. Uh, we did a book study called Breaking Down the Wall that was very well attended by um, L teachers and also district staff. We gave some information about PIC, the parent information system, uh, and the center and how that works. And um, then we talked about Imagine Learning, which as the school committee knows, we purchased this year, and uh, it has been wonderful to have that Imagine Learning. And we talked about the bilingual programs, what's coming up, cross-linguistic connections, data analysis. So uh, the newsletters were uh, full of really important information. So we also uh, draft a framework for working with multilingual families. So this is uh, Worcester Family Engagement, self-assessment that we did. Uh, we want to have a number one focus for us was building positive relationships. And this is our plan for self-assessment uh, self first on um, building uh, positive relationships. This was on uh, promoting family well-being self-assessment on that, and also on promoting pathways for partnership with families. And uh, this is the rubric that we used for that. We talked about supporting child and youth development, learning, health, and also well-being. So that's our uh, template of, uh, of engaging with families and self-assessing ourselves on where we were with that. Uh, several organizations partner with the Worcester Public Schools. Uh, so what we gave you here for academic support is these are all the agencies that we partnered with this year. Uh, how many students 
are involved, what grade they were, uh, what schools um, or demographics that we need to know to work with, um, what was the time of support, most of it was after school, the type of support, also the highlights of supporting remote learning and challenges with supporting remote learning. So that's our community organization academic support. And I'm not sure if you can all see that, but it was working with ACE, Cultural Exchange Through Soccer, Worcester Alliance for Refugee Ministry, uh, Southeast Asian Coalition, uh, RAP, uh, PPAL, the Worcester Family Partnership, Lock Mentoring Program, Latino Institute at Worcester State with Kathy Arango, and the Worcester Public Library. We also, there were monthly community meetings that were attended. Um, this was for L's. So there was also attendance. This is the agenda for the monthly meetings that we did with the community. So they started August 31st, 2020, and they go all the way down to June 7th, met every single month on those, and there's a list of the registration list, the agenda, and the number of organizations that are in attendance. So I think it's important that people listening in the community realize that um, anywhere from 11 to 16 organizations were present at these meetings. So Community Partnership Spreadsheet is a, another community engagement spreadsheet that we used. Uh, we took all the managers and uh, we listed additional organizations that we all partnered with. So some additional ones that I didn't already read to you is Seven Hills Foundation, uh, Ascentria, Anna Maria College, Art Reach, Assumption College, Berkeley School of Music, Black Families Together, Boston College, Boys and Girls Club, Broad Meadow Brook. And then we also included this, um, the Chief Diversity Office's work in networking, and then um, the many things we did in partner with the City of Worcester. We did many connected messages to the community um, to the point that when we had graduation, uh, parents asked me, if, please don't call me during the summer because we called them so much. They said, please don't call me. So, um, and they laughed, but you know, we, we were constantly informing parents through ConnectEd. Um, so this is some, I gave you an example of messages that we did, uh, ConnectEd, um, superintendent's updates that also were posted on the website and also our Worcester Public School app that went out from there. This is, uh, again, we, I don't know if you know, because it just happened recently, but we have our own bilingual radio station now. Um, it's going extremely well. I'm a guest at it. Uh, this is our bilingual radio station. Um, it, we bring different topics, and people call in and speak to us. Um, and it's uh, WCUW 31.3 on FM, and we're on every Wednesday, 4 to 5. So uh, as the school committee knows, uh, we had many community forums. Uh, we had the educational model response on, on August 10th, February 12th, March 15th, March 29th. Uh, we had learning model response about remote or in-person learning survey, April 3rd, May 4th, and then May 17th start date. We also had online question submissions for community forums at where the, they would put the questions first and then we would do the presentation and then answer their questions. And we also had the middle school caregiver interest survey for the remote academy. Uh, you were all, uh, school committee was all uh, here. Uh, when we presented this, um, this was also on our website. This is just an example of uh, what the district transitioned to hybrid learning, but we had uh, this document for every single transition that we did. We also had meetings on budget, um, which also uh, 
does, we'll be talking about that in another goal, but that is another communication that uh, we use to talk to parents and community members regarding the Worcester Public School budget. Uh, we've had a lot of the Doherty building hearings, also planning and updates. I participated as a member of the Doherty High uh, Building Committee. Uh, we've had a lot of meetings on the New South High that will soon be opened. Um, I'm a committee member and I'm also on the district oversight group. We also had some, uh, community forums uh, with special ed parents um, during this time. So I included with you, for you, uh, the, it, the first one we had, which was February 10th, on parents' rights, the IEP process, and it was all put on by the Office of Special Education. We also uh, had other uh, forums that were in Spanish for children with disabilities, family that have children with disabilities. Uh, when we were looking at uh, becoming, when we were equity detectives uh, working with, doctors, um, with uh, Dr. Irvin Scott from Harvard University, uh, we discovered uh, that there was some concern about at sixth grade, how do decisions be made for students going into the seventh grade that does not prevent them from getting into advanced placement courses when they get to high school. So we held four family scheduling forums, uh, with one for each of the middle schools with interpreters to explain um, scheduling, uh, to suggest to parents that they try to get their children in honors classes, and that work will con continue uh, regarding scheduling and uh, looking to see how at grade six are we setting the course for a student's life by the decisions that we make. Uh, we also had a South High family meeting, a uh, remote return for South High because uh, they had to go back to remote uh, so that they could demolition the, the current school. We, and this is an example, as you all know, you also attended scheduling forums. So we had scheduling forums, and these were the schedulings that we did in the scheduling forums so that we could explain the schedule to parents so their children would be well informed. We also had special education advisory PAC meetings, and this is an example of the PAC meeting, the sessions. I gave you the agenda, the times, and all these are in the community resources that were given to the families. Special education also had family-based trainings. Uh, we partnered with community, uh, Quincy Community College, and there was a PAC meeting. Uh, we talked about transitioning from high school to college. This was the Worcester Public Schools, Special Ed PAC, and uh, Q -Q QCC Student Accessibility Services. And we had that on March 25th from 4.30 to 5.30. to the next one. Uh, we also offered uh, a parent workshop on social emotional well-being during the continued pandemic. And uh, that was a SPED SEL leadership team. Uh, they uh, provided an agenda, uh, you know, uh, it, it was about reinforcement, how you can use it at your home also, about token economies, behavioral contracts, home learning schedules, about anxiety and how do you deal anxiety during the pandemic, what are the coping strategies that you can use with your entire family, and community and Worcester Public School uh, resources. And then we explained all of those things. So I gave you a, a copy of that work we did for special ed parents. Uh, we updated the parent portal, and we wanted to take, uh, this is data, on the parent portal. This tells you how many people were involved, um, how many accounts were created, how many students were claimed, the access um, to the parent portal. Uh, as you know, we're still in summer school right now. Uh, we really wanted to get the information out to parents about summer school, communication again, 
Uh, these are all the registration forms that are done in all the languages. Uh, also, information about summer school. So I thought you would find it very interesting um, to find, because again, this goal was about communicating in as many ways as you can to families. And in the Worcester Public Schools, you have to communicate through uh, translation and documents. So uh, between 9, 19, 2019 and 3, 12, 2020, uh, we translated uh, 3,533 documents, which is 25,365 pages. Uh, 2,255 in person or on video, 3,250 phone interpretations in 50 different language for a total of 28,703 minutes. Uh, between 3-13-2020 and 6-30-2020, uh, we translated 2,393 documents, 100 in-person or video interpretations, 5,600 phone interpretations in 58 different languages for a total of 54,399. And then uh, from 7-1-2020 to, the, to this June, we translated 7,366 documents or 50,380 pages, 3,143 in-person or video interpretations, and 14,990 phone interpretations in 74 language of a total of 144,346 minutes. So I think that, you know, this, and then this is just a chart showing you what we did interpret. Again, uh, we are communicating with our families, interpreting in their language, and making them feel welcome in the Worcester Public Schools. So that is the end of goal one. Okay, on to goal two, student learning goal. 50% of students in grades four, five, and six participated in the fall star baseline math assessment will achieve an SGP of 40 or higher by June 2021. So this is the goal, again, that I told you we are still working on. So let's look at the data on, on this goal. So the chart summarize uh, the student growth from fall of 20, let me put it a little bigger. I think you guys you can see it, the people that are in here. How's that? Uh, from the fall of 2020 to spring of 2021. Now remember, we're only doing uh, for this presentation, grades four through six, because that was the goal. Um, we divide them into two categories. Uh, low growth is if you're less than 40, and typical and high growth is if you're more than 40. And then divided by uh, remote or in school. So as you can see, the green shows you that we did um, make that goal for grade six at 53%. Um, in grade four, 60% of the students had low growth. In grade four, 40% had high growth. In grade five, 54% had low growth. 46 had high growth. Grade six, 47 had low growth. 53 had high. So 50, if we add them all together, four through six, 54% uh, had low growth, and 46% had high growth. Now, if we go over to the far right, uh, it's not a surprise that on all testing that we did, uh, students did better if they were in school than they were remote. And there can be a lot of factors for that. Um, it's hard to test students when they're in remote. And it's a much more controlled setting when they're in school. So remote students, 57% of students at remote showed low growth in math. 43% showed high growth in remote. In school, 52 showed low growth and 48 showed high growth. Now, if we want to go to the number of students here, so in grade four, uh, 954 students showed low growth. 
627 showed high. Grade 5, low growth was 813 students, and 689 had high. Grade 6, 767 had low growth, and 879 had high growth. Again, looking over here again at who was remote, who was in school, uh, 908 students remote showed low growth, and 1626 showed low growth that were in school. High growth, remote 686, in school 1509. Now we wanted to look at them by grade and look at remote and in school. So in grade four, 64% of the kids in remote had low growth. 36% of the kids in remote had high. In school, 59% had low growth and 41% had high. Grade five, remote. 57% had low growth, 43 had high growth. In school, 53 had low growth and 47 had high. Grade six, remote 50% had low growth and 50% had high. And in school, 45% uh, had low growth and 55% had high. So in, in looking at that, uh, you know, the, the question would be, what are we going to do next year? Because we're showing that uh, our current, um, before, before June, grade four and five students um, have concerning amount of low growth. So, you know, the first part of that is we have to assess um, exactly what that gap is. And uh, we're working on, um, I'm sure you may have seen that, Jesse has a called a acceleration roadmap uh, for uh, students. And what that basically means is that uh, you don't tell a, third, a fourth grade teacher they're going to teach third grade work. Um, it's a whole way of the fourth grade teacher incorporating the skills that kids need to learn that they may have a gap for into grade four. So the next question is, how did the subgroups do here? Interesting enough, uh, statistically, uh, low growth for male or female um, was about the same, 54 and 53. High growth, 46 and 47. So there wasn't a large difference between whether you were male or female. There was a large group uh, gap. Uh, not surprisingly, but there was a very large gap between not low income and low income. So as you can see, um, not low income met the goal of 55%. Low income was 43% uh, high, 57% low growth. Also, our two subgroups that we are always looking uh, at with data and looking for uh, ways to increase their knowledge and decrease the gap are our L population and our students with disabilities. So, for our L population, not for our L population, 65% had low growth and 35% had high. Non-L, 50% had low growth and 50% had high growth. Uh, we're going to go with our special ed population now. Uh, Non-special ed, I uh, was pretty close. 51% low growth and 49% high. And our students with disabilities. 66%, pretty close to the L of 65%, had low growth, and 34% had high. And now we want to know, OK, what race uh, groups are, are struggling? Because that's always a very important part of what we're looking at. So if you look at this, we can see where, where the green is, that um, who had high growth? So our white population had high growth, 
our Asian population met um, the goal, our multi-race non-Hispanic met the goal, and our Native American met the goal. Who did not uh, make the goal? So our Hispanic Latino population had 59% low growth and 41% high, and our African American population had 53% low growth and for only 47% high growth. So what are some of the um, assessments, are the mass assessment da uh, data that we looked at? And this is what resources could we use and did we use? So we use, this is a, a principal's training. And uh, this was on assessments and start training that principals received training on, um, the schedule, what the assessment schedule was. Um, included in this, I also gave you the parent guardian report that was provided to parents and guardians, um, the administration uh, for family, home administration of the STAR, as well as a teacher guide for them uh, giving the STAR data. We provided um, a lot, the uh, Office of OCPL uh, did provide um, other supports. You're looking now at the common assessment data that uh, through the Envisions program. Um, the quarters uh, are not related in that there's different standards that are taught in quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. Um, Understanding that, you know, if you can't, if you're learning, for example, to add and subtract in quarter one with single digit numbers, and when you go to quarter two, you're learning to add and subtract with double digit numbers, there is some carryover in skills, but the skills are, are different. So in quarter one, 57% of the, of the students met the, the benchmarks in grade three. Uh, and as you can look across, 45% in quarter two, 56% in quarter three, and 49% in quarter four. Again, those are not, you can't compare those. Uh, each of them are separate quarters. And I put the participation rate in there so you can see how many students were included in this, which is a large sample. Quarter four, I mean, uh, uh, grade four, uh, quarter one is 62%, quarter two, 49, quarter three, 39, and quarter four. 52% met the benchmarks. Uh, the same thing for, um, as you can see, grade five, 46, 38, 35, 54. And grade six, um, 53, 40, 46, and 48. Now this is the Alex data. It wasn't something that you asked for. However, um, I thought this was interesting. You would find, because it's math, uh, these are students in grades seven through 12. So um, students using Alex, it tells you the number of hours they used it, and then it tells you where they were for their beginning and where they are with their ending and what tasks they have been successful at. Um, so in the, the beginning for, for middle school math, uh, they, they started at 53 and went up to 82. There was a gain of 29 points. Algebra 1, there was a gain of 14 points. Geometry, a gain of 14 points, and Algebra 2, a gain of 9 points. Um, ST Math is one of my favorite programs. Uh, it's an expensive program. When I first became superintendent, I really wanted to get that. And with public schools, we're able to get only one in one school, but it was Union Hill, and that set uh, for us the uh, confidence of the ST math group, and uh, we can say we, now we're very proud. We have it in LA, every elementary school. So how that works is there's puzzles, there's problem solving, there's informative feedback that students get. Um, let me just make this a little bigger for you to see. So this shows you um, the harder, easier, questions, the patterns, and you can see that um, students made great progress. Uh, we actually received a letter of congratulations uh, from ST Math as being a model program that they are toting through the state of uh, Worcester Public Schools and the use of ST Math. 
So you can see that you are seeing that there is progress there. Kids went from 54 to 65, 69 to 75. So there, all the way down, there is progress that students made on the ST math. So on this ST math, uh, you can see that 12,861 students were doing the puzzles. Um, you can see how many 16 million puzzles were completed. 111,000 objectives were, con were conquered. And you can see the number of minutes that were played. So an average of 57 minutes per week. And our students were solving an average of 33 puzzles per week. And then this is a list of all the professional development activities that was, were all given in the area of math. And then the next thing, still on the same goal, uh, is our effort to continue to observe teacher practice in math. So this is the characteristics of high quality instructional practices. Uh, we are working, all principals are involved in a network leadership group. Uh, we work with Brett Lane from Instill and Giselle Martin-Kemp from LCI. Uh, it's an instructional walkthrough tool. It was used virtually uh, this year. So the walkthrough tool looks like this. It's a Google Sheet. Um, everybody, during the year when we were in person, we have it on our phones. Uh, you go into a classroom. You look at certain targeted skills. For example, dimension one is academic goals and skills. You rate what you see, one through four. It, we have look, look for, so you know what you're looking for. It tells you in the rubric what one, two, three, and four is. We also look for effective use of time. Uh, and we also look for DOK, which is student cognition and depth of knowledge. We also do dimension four, which is use of formative or in-class assessments. So besides uh, teachers learning how to use technology, communicating with families, checking every day to see if everybody uh, emotionally was well, taking training on um, literacy and uh, math, uh, we also uh, made sure that we did classroom walkthroughs. And this is something that I want to share with you that I'm very excited about, and so is Carmen Melendez. I'm very excited about. So we wanted to see what would the outcomes of math intervention in Spanish be. So we wanted to teach children that spoke Spanish math in Spanish. So this, was, this happened at two schools, Chandler Magnet and Woodland. This tells you the number of students. Um, I think it's important to see the attendance of, of, of the students because I want to show you what happened. So these were tutors that uh, they were prof college professors. They speak Spanish fluently. Uh, and I want to tell you that they developed uh, assessments. They gave pretest and post-test. So this is not evidence-based, but this, the power of this is something that we're going to continue to explore. So uh, in grade three, uh, there was a pretest, and 18.2% of the class passed. At midpoint, 100% passed, and 100% passed at the post test. So it went from 80, I mean 37.3 to 87.8 average to 84.5. In grade four, it went from 33.7, where only 6.7% passed, to 100 passing again at the midpoint and at the post-test. And in grades 5 and 6, from only 16.7 passing to 80% passing. So this is something that you know, we want to continue to, to explore with our, our students who are native speakers. We also, we also ha are, are very involved with um, UDL options for um, universal design learning. So this is an example, um, make it a little bit larger, for options for UDL. So universal design learning is what we're doing in the Worcester Public Schools. We're working with a group called CAST. Uh, 
We are all the administrators are actually reading um, a book on um, racial equity in UDL. Uh, the combination of working uh, with the UDL model to address issues of, of equity and anti-racism. And so this is the framework for UDL in the elementary. Um, give you a couple of seconds. Let me just um, roll it up a little bit so you can see it. Um, it, it this, you know, UDL, Universal Design Learning, is about access, engagement, access representation, action and expression, building engagement, persistence, about what about language and symbols, about expression and communication, how do we internalize engagement, how do we self-regulate, um, how do we internalize action expression, and how do we internalize representation. So that um, ends uh, the evidence that is for uh, the student learning goal. The district improvement goal one which is increasing the diversity of new hires to 17% by June 2021. Uh, I'd like to share with you the diversity data. This was put together through a variety of sources. So the goal is there. 25.5% uh, of new hires in 21 were people of color. That's a 3.1 point increase from the 22.4 which was taken at, in the school year 2018. Now this is from the internal Worcester Public School HR data system. Uh, we have 3.4% more staff in 21 than in 18. We have an increase of 160 staff. Worcester Public School has 105 more staff of color in 21 than we had in 18. And I put this in bold. So 20.3 of staff, percent of staff in this 21 year were of color compared to 18.8 in, in uh, school year 18. The percentage of staff of color increased by 1.5 percentage points. There were 34, 33 more teachers of color, which is 11.2 increase. Uh, this is two percentage point higher than the increase in white teachers during the same time period. Um, but despite the increase in teachers of color, uh, their proportion in our workforce only increased from 12.8 to 13 percent. I'm proud to say that there were 12 more administrative staff in 21. Uh, the majority of the staff were white in 18, 82.0 and 84.1 in 21. But there was a 2.1 percentage point increase in white administrative staff in a three-year period. The increase in diversity of new hires to 17%, uh, this is 25.5 of new hires in 21 were people of color. That's a 3.1 point increase from the 22.4 in 18. Um, so there's an overall increase in the percentage of the workforce that has five or few years experience from 18 to 21, so 44.8, to 49.6, uh, respectively. Uh, we will begin our 21-22 school year with 12 principals of color, which is 25% leading our schools. And it's interesting uh, that we're looking at the state data, and Worcester Public Schools has a more racially diverse workforce um, compared to the state since at least uh, school year 16. So in 21, 16.2 of the Worcester Public School staff were non-white, and the state is at 11.9. So I'm showing you now the um, Worcester Public School's Office of Diversity baseline data. So uh, the goal one is, is the one that we just explained to you. Uh, we are committed to increasing the number of qualified teachers of color in the district uh, who represent the cultures of our student population. Um, and then uh, you can read, that's a summary of what I already said. Uh, these were the uh, Yvonne and I sat down. And this is the district goals that we set for this year. 
um, and also the strategies for uh, meeting the goals. So we, we really wanted to increase the number of staff of color in professional ranks. We established drop-in hours for virtual or in person uh, with the chief diversity officer to support the retention of staff of color, worked closely with HR to cultivate a diverse candidate, candidate pool that is more available to school and district leaders when openings arrive. Uh, we are supporting, uh, we initiated and supporting the current instructional assistance of color to pursue teaching as a profession in partnership with the JET program. We are also providing MTEL support. Uh, we are also paying for the mentor of each of the instructional assistants but by a retired Worcester Public School uh, teacher or administrator. Uh, we are continuing to focus on collaborative pathways for our current teachers of color to enter leadership positions, either through coaching, assistant principal, or by being a principal. Uh, we are, uh, received a grant, or working on a grant actually right now, to increase the number of teachers of color to lead advanced placement courses uh, for the Worcester Public School high schools. And we have increased uh, the number of students involved in Worcester Future Teacher Clubs, and we're gonna be piloting it in the middle schools. So the chief diversity officer meets monthly uh, with the city chief diversity offices, which is the Worcester Police Department, the Fire Department, and the city of Worcester. Uh, they share conversation about diversity, inclusion, and retention strategies. Uh, Yvonne also works with the DESE Network meetings uh, and also collaborates with the Office of English Learners and Special Ed to expand our equity work, diversity, and inclusion in those areas. Uh, we have done a lot of training this year on equity, diversity, inclusion, and retention, so we continue to promote training in those areas. Uh, we, uh, uh, she has attended virtual and in-person job fairs, so we could expand the recruitment of applicants of color, working with local colleges, again, to try to recruit teacher candidates. Uh, we only used to use uh, one school spring. Uh, in order to recruit uh, candidates. And uh, through Yvonne's networking, uh, we now are using additional ways of recruiting. So we're using Handshake. Uh, she's reached out to historical black colleges and universities, uh, attended virtual recruitment fairs. Uh, we also are working to uh, strengthen our network on the state. And uh, we're work we share on how do we um, increase our retention strategies and our recruitment strategies? Uh, this year, uh, through the work with Real Talk, there was more people that got involved with the affinity groups. And uh, we are working to create an equity plan with my superintendent's advisory council and also the Worcester Public School legal team. We have a superintendent's diversity committee uh, this is uh, the dates that we met, February 3rd, March 3rd, March 31st, April 21st, May 5th, and May 19th. Uh, we presented um, our information, um, Yvonne did actually, to the Leon, which is a, a group that uh, is funded through United Way to work on um, promoting diversity in the Worcester Public Schools. We uh, had Christina, Curiosis and Kathy Knowles did work on Panorama. Uh, Brett uh, and Giselle uh, talked about culture responsive learn assented practices. Uh, this is all our training that we have done for our staff this year. We're and continue to do next year. We're doing equity work with Dr. Irvin Leon Scott from the Harvard School of Education. Uh, we are doing collaborative problem solvings. It'll be in five Worcester Public Schools, full faculty next year, and then in the spring, another five schools. Um, that is um, Dr. Stuart Alblom. And uh, this is the people who are on our superintendent's advisory committee. They represent um, all groups uh, in our community. And uh, they also were present on, uh, invited to go to all of them and different groups of them attended on all job interviews for district positions.
uh, and they also attended all the pr meetings for new principals. So here's our new recruitment outreach. <laughs> we, we do handshake. Uh, NEMNET now, uh, we did it through Maybe, Matsol, we go to local colleges. Uh, we went to the Merck Fair on April 22nd. Um, we did the Teachers Lounge April Virtual Hiring Fair. And then uh, this is the, we attend all the DESI Diversity Network meetings. For outreach and recruitment, um, Yvonne is part of the Diversity Network. Uh, who's on the diversity network is Boston, Lowell, Everett, Worcester, Akron, Ohio. And there were two dates uh, that those groups met. Uh, we also are really happy this year that uh, we were able to recruit two bilingual educators from Spain. So uh, they are both working in our dual language program and our traditional bilingual education program. We ran two ESL MTEL course prep courses for free. 48 educators participated in the ESL MTEL prep sessions during this year. Uh, we developed a promotional flyer. I'll show you what it looks like. Again, communicating. Uh, we are in need of ESL teachers. So this flyer went out. Are uh, you looking to, become a, uh, to get ESL license? What do you need to pass this? The objectives for the course, the course requirement, the book, please sign up in Teach Point, and these are the topics and the schedule. Uh, due to funding, the ESL master's program was not funded last year. However, uh, it is going to begin this fall of 2021. Uh, we also um, have 26. Worcester Public School educators that participate in the bilingual endorsement certificate uh, through BC. And this is an a informational flyer on the bilingual certificate program. Uh, it was free to eligible Worcester and Milford educators, so it was worth around $3,200. It was all taught by Boston College professors, and it was online, and there were hybrid courses also, and the face-to-face -face sessions were held in Worcester. This is still on the same goal about hiring. So we have a Worcester Public Schools, Worcester State University administrative cohort. Uh, we have 12 participants in it. Three are candidates of color. They will be interns this fall in, in their schools of choice. And we also have the JEP program right now. Five or of 16 are candidates of color. We are uh, embracing multilingualism by also um, having a conference. So we ran our first uh, multilingualism con conference. It was run by Carmen Melendez and her staff. Uh, it was uh, la uh, last year, um, August 20th to 21st. And it's all about our, our commitment to embracing multilingualism. And this uh, shows you the event. I was a guest speaker just for the welcome and the opening. And then the subjects that we're talking about, social cultural competence, talking about equity and social justice. <coughs> um, and we are running that conference again this year. So it's going to be at North High School. And more information will be coming. There were 69 people that attended. Um, I really like the affinity meetings that are happening. Uh, there were 67 participants uh, that went to these meetings. And the, a, a, there's a steering committee of Worcester Public School, teachers and administrators of color. Uh, here's an example. Uh, Dr. Irvin Scott um, also uh, went and spoke to them. Uh, this was the brochure, again, uh, communicating to everybody. You can see our uh, ish here. Um, part of the planning committee on, uh, and also attending the affinity groups. Show you. So there is a planning committee. Uh, they, uh, they meet with Yvonne and Carmen, and they develop the whole agenda. Um, for example, there was a culturally responsive education conversation on this. There was a conversation about family engagement. Uh, 
brainstorming on activities and ideas from Worcester so that our, um, our allies and our, our teachers, administrators of color uh, can feel comfortable, uh, feel they have a voice that is listening to them and have part in um, any type of structural change. That ends uh, the evidence for improvement goal one. And we now we are in improvement goal two, which is develop an annual budget that is aligned with the strategic plan. So as we know, this is, um, this was the goal. Uh, this is uh, the budget um, linked uh, to the strategic plan. Um, went, we went through the strategic plan and I'm just showing you what, um, what is connected directly to the strategic plan. Uh, the culture of innovation, in, uh, innovation and exactly those budget items that uh, school committee is very familiar with um, from doing the budget sessions. Um, also have to um, acknowledge um, the work of both uh, Brian Allen and Sarah Consalvo um, also and that whole finance team on also putting uh, this budget together and as we know it is another award winning budget that many college people use as their textbook uh, for their class. So uh, welcoming schools, you know, we have our school adjustment counselors. As you can see, I'll just scroll through so you can see how the strategic plan and the budget matches. These for highlights for investing in educators and highlights for technology and operations. And I know you've already seen the budget book. Um, I'm not sure if everybody knows what, al I know the principals in the background here know, but the allocation meeting. So this is it, just an example of the schedule. So every year in January, uh, we put out this schedule and principals meet with their school council. Uh, they meet with their um, leadership team and uh, they come, I'll show you the form they come with, and uh, they then present what do they need from the budget uh, so that their schools uh, can meet the needs of the students in their schools. Uh, I know there's always a question um, asked by a school committee, uh, did, uh, did your um, school council actually go through and actually see all this? So in here are the school council agendas, uh, who was present and also um, how they, what they voted on to bring to the budget meeting. Here's what the form looks like. So this is the allocation form that they receive. Uh, their FY20 number of current staff is filled out. They fill out the FY21, the change from their current year, and uh, they present uh, why they are requesting those things from the budget. We also uh, joined with the school committee for the legislative meeting to talk to our uh, government officials to ask them to lobby for equitable funding um, beginning in December 2020. And then these are the community forums that we have. That's the evidence on uh, goal two. And uh, this is our district improvement goal three. Lower the out of school suspension rate by 5% for special education group C students with emotional disabilities using evidence based targeted interventions and resources. So, this is our data. So, there were 1,125 group C students in the 2021. 743 of those students returned to school on March 15th. 2% of the Group C students, which is 15 students that returned to school in March, had an out of school suspension. Let me make this a little larger for you. So, there were three females and there were 12 males, a total of 15 students. Uh, st students with disabilities, uh, there were 15, uh, they could be student disabilities and L, so you see six there. They also could be students with disability, B and L, and low income, so you say 13 here. 
Uh, there were eight Hispanics, four Afro-Americans, two whites, zero Asians, and one multi-race non-Hispanic. Uh, the second column shows the district enrollment for each of those groups. And then the discipline rate of how many, what is the discipline rate on the number of students compared to the district enrollment and what was their discipline rate. Now, there were only 15 students. However, um, out of those 15 students, which is a very small number, um, who were the ones that got suspended the most? Uh, they were males, they were L students, low income, Hispanic and Afro-American uh, black students. Uh, those underrepresented were white and Asian students. Now, this slide here. So, 592. So you have to, when you're doing data, compare apples with apples, right? Not with apples and oranges. So there were 592 Group, group C students who returned to school in March 21 that were also enrolled in 2019. So we went back to 2019. 14% of those Group C students were suspended at least once in 2019, which was 80 students, all right? So again, these are the students that were in school, all right, Group C in 2019 and in school with us now, uh, in Group C, special ed. None were suspended in 2021. So what are we doing about discipline? So we're continuing our work with collaborative problem solving. What, you know, what is collabor collaborative problem solving? So this is basically, there was a pre-survey that was sent out to all staff in 12 schools, and we wanted to gather baseline data. Now, collaborative problem solving is from a group called Think Kids. Uh, Think Kids is an affiliate of Massachusetts General Hospital, and it's co-authored by, again, Dr. Stuart Album. So what is that? What, what is Think Kids? So uh, this is, is a video here, if anybody wants to see it uh, in the future. But basically, it says that Think Kids, we recognize that kids with challenging behavior don't lack the will to behave well. They lack the skill. So this approach is to reduce challenging behaviors, teach kids the skill they lack, and build relationships with the adults in their lives. It says anyone can learn collaborative problem solving, and they're here to help us. So uh, there's information, and one of their statements that I love is that kids do well if they can. And so it's a very simple, as they say, but a very powerful philosophy. You know, it focuses on building skills like flexibility, what do you do when you're frustrating, uh, you know, what, if you have a low tolerance, how do children learn to problem solve, um, rather than motivating kids to behave by, you know, if you do this, you get this reward. Um, because what happens oftentimes is that eventually when the reward is taken away, the student's behavior um, regresses. And I think this is very important to know that um, Mass General Hospital is the number one ranked Department of Psychiatry in the United States. So we, we are very excited uh, that we're working with them, uh, that they want to work with us for a whole district approach um, to working with our kids. So uh, their data is 73% uh, reduction in oppositional behavior during school. Parents report improvements in their parent-child interactions, and there are 71% fewer self-inflicted injuries. So this training, um, we, we started, we've already started this training. Um, as you can see, that um, their training was June 15, 16, 17, 18. That was our Tier 1 2020. Uh, we were uh, not able to continue during the pandemic uh, because as you teach your skills, you have to practice it on children. And you can't practice it on children remote. So uh, we start our training in August again. And again, we're very excited to do that. Uh, so what else are we doing that's helping us to lower our suspension rate? So we're doing culture responsive pedagogy. 
Uh, we have a network leadership documents, a training for our staff, uh, coaches. This, these are the dates uh, of all the strategy sec uh, sessions, the TAG grant sessions. TAG grant is what the state gives those schools that are in danger of um, being underperforming. Um, and it, it gives you funding so that you're able to close the gap and work on whatever your school needs to improve for your students. So this is a list of the schools that are involved in that. I included also the agendas for the elementary, the middle of the high school, the turnaround agendas for elementary, middle and high, and also uh, middle school. So this is, uh, we really wanted to integrate culture responsive learn ascendant practices into the curriculum and the culture of our schools. So this is a Worcester Public School document. Uh, I have a working definition there for you to read uh, that learn ascended culture responsive education simultaneously upholds high standards for academic excellence and cultural competence. It honors the strengths, cultures, lives, and experience of all students, provides them with meaningful and authentic learning experiences. So in our work that we have been working uh, diligently through this year, uh, there are three key tenets. One is academic excellence, cultural competency, and critical consciousness. So the work of culture responsive practices occurs through academic excellence. So it's not taught separately, it's through the work and the practices that culture responsive work is done. And there's uh, principles for a theory of action. action. It really is talking about the Worcester Public Schools adopting an equity-oriented framework. And that way of thinking is very crucial uh, as we move forward. It is using uh, data, sharing it, and uh, this year we spent some time exposing inequities. Uh, we also spent some time looking at the impacts of structure and uh, things that we really never thought were happening. Uh, we exposed and had a conversation about it and are working uh, every day to try to improve those things. Uh, we also, 13 Worcester Public School AVID elementary schools, four AVID middle schools, and nine elementary teachers registered for two virtual literacy workshops. Um, also, uh, as part of kids, books, and anti-racism series at Leslie in March and April. So each of our participants received two related author books. Uh, each attendee was responsible for bringing the information back to their school. Um, Sharon Leary, who, who coordinates our AVID program, and Stephanie Wong, who's from Leslie University. Um, they had a Google Meet with all our AVID site administrators to answer questions. And um, the workshops are really uh, here for you. And it was about kids, books, and anti-racism series. Um, also, two additional staff of color did receive a scholarship to attend the multi-day summer series. So this is an example of the, um, the workshops. Uh, we had a lot of book reads this year. Um, one of the workshops was Breathing New Life into Book Clubs. Uh, they've been very popular uh, with our staff and also our administrators. Uh, we had leadership trainings to inform work with staff on meeting the needs of English language learners. Uh, another on meeting the needs of students with special needs. Uh, we started with Dr. Irvin Scott um, on October 13th, and um, it was training for our staff on leading for access and equity. We had done part one in the summer, and uh, we now have met with Dr. Irvin Scott six times, and we are um, continuing. We met him in August training, October training, January training, February training, March and May, oh, seven times. Um, and, you know, one thing I have to say about the professional development that we were able to offer is that because we had Fridays off for so long uh, without students, uh, we were able to get um, some of the best professional development for our staff uh, that we never would have been able to get um, if we didn't, didn't have that time. Uh, one person I want to uh, talk about is Dr. Miriam Jernigan Noessi. 
Uh, she was uh, we were connected to us through Dr. Heather Forky, who is our partner at UMass Medical School on trauma training. And we received uh, the most amazing training on racial trauma. Um, she is uh, seen as an expert uh, in that area, and it was racial trauma and education. Uh, it was all paid for, the series was paid for by the University of Massachusetts Medical School, so I want to make sure I thank them for that. Uh, we received, um, we received uh, materials and a, a really uh, amazing lecture, um, and, and she's interested in, in working with us again. We also had um, staff meetings to work with building level staff and students, so I um, listed these for you just to tell you a few of them. Uh, we talked about trauma support on September 4th, October 9th, strategies to reduce anxiety with students, December 18th, Dr. Heather Forkey on isolation that, uh, and loneliness. Uh, that was an amazing training for us because, as you know, uh, by December 18th, we were still home and we were still in remote. And not only uh, were students feeling isolation and lonely, but so were staff. Um, on January 24th, we had Sandy Hook promise, protecting children from gun violence and prevention, and also second step. Um, and then on May 19th, engagement strategies for students. Uh, right here, I have also for you a list of all the Worcester Public School UDL overview work that we did, universal design learning. There were five sessions. There are videos including in this. There were coaches session. There were district administration team sessions. Um, Worcester Public School UDL, there's a hundred, uh, 101 course was established and offered in the spring of summer 2021. We have 50 participants today and we're going to be continuing that with 21-22. Um, here, uh, I think this is so timely. Uh, I know the school committee had a presentation by Kathy Knowles um, about Panorama. We're using Panorama in grades 7 through 12. Uh, part of the Panorama is that students answer their own answer survey. So Panorama believes um, you cannot support the whole child until you know what the whole child looks like. So they talk about your data has to be actionable, you have to have insight about the whole child that includes social emotional learning. So uh, we did SEL questions uh, for the students and um, this was the student competency we did in the fall and then uh, also about student supports in the environment. And this tells you about their social awareness, 58%. Um, had social awareness, 51, growth mindset, emotional regulation, 45, and self-efficacy, 37. Sense of belonging, belonging that kids felt like they belonged, was for only 40%, and engagement was 30. Now, again, that was in the fall of 2020. Uh, this also uh, tells us who's on track for college and career readiness, on track for graduation, who's at risk, and who is critical. So, a teacher can see all their students and by these colors they can tell who is at risk and, and, and who isn't. And uh, so this is an example of, of the work that we did. Green means that, for example, this is South High, all students uh, green, academics. Uh, yellow was attendance, behavior, green again, SEL. Um, some kids may need some additional work on that. So the key findings uh, were encouraging for us with the panorama. Um, so, so in fall, growth mindset, 51% favorability, and spring, we kept it. Uh, the social awareness went up by 1%. Uh, emotional regulation, being able to regulate your emotions, went up by 3%. Self-efficacy went from 37% to 41%. Uh, sense of belonging went up 1%, engagement stayed at 30. Uh, we also did the equity survey with our staff, uh, and uh, the students did the one in the winter on equity, and the fa uh, faculty also did it. And in diversity and inclusion, 79% of the students felt that 
diversity, inclusion was recognized and valued and that there was cultural awareness and action by 65%. The staff, um, their scores were 68%, um, just our students, culturally aware, and uh, adult, adults, 64%, and educating all students at 75%. So we felt as though those were good starting places. Uh, also, uh, we wanted to do uh, strength-based leadership training with our principals. So uh, uh, everybody did a survey. Um, and uh, that strength-based is about building your team and empowering the individual in you. Uh, it's part of the Gallic uh, strength-based assessment. Uh, we did the meetings on the Clifton Strengths on October 5 and October 6. And then principals were consider them, uh, look at their team and their building, look at that Clifton Strengths assessment, and be able to identify what leadership they have in their building that will help to um, make the most improvement for the students in the building. I gave you some more information on that, uh, what is strength-based leadership for the L department, and how do we leverage, leverage these strengths. Uh, the special ed department developed a new FBA evaluation template, uh, uh, functional behavioral assessment, what FBA stands for, and um, also there was a behavior assessment um, also by the Office of Social Emotional Learning. We inc uh, increased the number of functional behavior assessments. So what does that mean? That means if a student is experiencing um, some difficulty in the behavioral area, uh, do an assessment, and then you would know what kind of um, interventions that you need to have. So uh, 102 uh, behavioral assessments since 820. And uh, also we did a lot of special ed school-based training on remote engagement for special ed students. We did crisis intervention. And then in the spring, uh, we did return to in-person preparation. Uh, we knew that um, our students were going to be anxious coming back, so uh, we did a training on uh, skill building to reduce anxiety and challenging behaviors in students during challenging times. Uh, it was a nine, two 90-minute sessions uh, by two experts in the area. Every faculty member in the Worcester Public Schools saw those two films. Uh, there's a facilitator's guide that was developed, and there was a participant note taker. And um, then we had a spring newsletter on uh, behavioral services. So um, that is the end of the evidence and the presentation um, on the goals. Again, I just want to say that we uh, I met or exceeded every goal halfway through the year. It's only my mid-year. And we are still working on math progress uh, for grades four and five. Oh. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Farrell. Wow. What an outstanding uh, mid-cycle report. And may I congratulate the superintendent and her team and the principals for the many accomplishments as we saw here tonight. Uh, as we know, uh, Superintendent Benenge has done an outstanding job in moving our system forward and has stepped up with her team to deal with the pandemic crisis in which we're still concerned about. She has been an important team player with the mayor and the city manager in meeting the needs of the community during this crisis, helping with supplies in the city, providing much needed resources to our children and families. The idea of the city working together to provide the best education for our children has been ongoing during, this, during the tenure of Superintendent Benenda. And as we heard tonight, her commitment to education and the community has been ongoing. She has continued to be a strong and committed leader and has moved that system to the next level. Her qualities, as we well know, of commitment, especially passion, empathy, honest, honesty, and integrity certainly make up her character. She's a leader who motivates others, is a good listener, and a skillful communicator. 
The time commitment certainly has been exemplary, 24-7 for Mrs. Benunda. Tonight's report certainly shows the continued progress that has taken place with much professional development and training um, that has assisted our students in their academic achievement. There's been a great deal of two-way communication with families, as we heard tonight. And we've heard the message from that in the community about what is taking place. I hear it all the time. As shown, the communication is ongoing. We have had an increase in diverse, uh, diversity hires, and they've been well-qualified individuals. The system stepped up with future plans with recruitment from within our schools to encourage more students of color to consider teaching as a profession. We have continued with our plans to turn IAs into teachers uh, as we work with Worcester State University. We have continued to work on suspension reductions with more staff training, working with Mass General Hospital, working with parents, more outreach for students, and yes, the work must continue. We have seen a new school emerge as we start a dual language school coming this fall. This will be a comfortable atmosphere for our students as they can practice their language skills from recess time to lunch time to riding on the bus going home. Most impressive. The hundreds of evidence-based links that we noticed in this report and I'm sure anyone who's read the report uh, had spent a great deal of time going through it, uh, has been certainly exemplary. And again, keep in mind, this was only for 12, um, 12 month period. Over 209 unique forums and webinars were held to support the efforts of families. 66 additional district level public forums with interpreta interpretation help was also available. Four district Spanish forums in over 135 building based uh, meetings were offered across the district. In addition, the superintendent organized and participated, as she mentioned here tonight, over 461 meetings with community agencies to share information and coordinate support from students and families in the city. Again, as I mentioned, all in a 12-month period. Unbelievable. Just to name a few other links that impressed me were the success stories of the children from school to school, the many community organizations that assisted our district in academic support, and the family engagement data with so many agencies within our city willing to help out. Also, there has been other districts that uh, have reached out to Worcester, including Webster, Springfield, Boston, uh, who have uh, asked and have been there for ideas, support, and, co and collaboration. So needless to say, we have shown certainly urban leadership. One can say that the superintendent was here when she was hired, was not going to be an average person. You're here because you were awesome, and, you've, and I'm showing it here tonight. Again, congratulations, Superintendent Benender, in making a difference in this community and in our schools. Let's hope that you'll consider staying on after your contract expires. Thank you for all that you've done and for your great career as an educator. Anybody else? I do want, okay, go ahead. I was just going to say thank you to all the administrators and the uh, principals and the teachers for uh, working so hard during COVID-19. And it was a challenging time, and uh, everybody seemed to work cooperatively together. And uh, so, on behalf of the city, I just want to thank everybody. Um, some things we can focus on, I think, is the strategic plan working with the governance committee over the next uh, um, couple months and figure where we are going as a city uh, in the future. But uh, thank you again for all the hard work that uh, Superintendent and everybody did over the last year. Much appreciated. Jack, Mr. Thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you, you took uh, some of my words right out of my mouth. Yeah, I was going to thank the superintendent, the administration, the principals, the staff, the teachers, and the families for um, what was a challenging year. And I think we cannot understate what a difficult year it was for everybody in trying to determine how to educate students. I think we did a great job looking at COVID protocols in our schools and putting things into place and 
um, address remote learning effectively. And really, we're, we're, I heard good reports from a lot of families about remote learning. I think that was very positive. And I think the communication, the forums were really effective as well. And I think that they were, they were helpful. They were long. But I think they really did provide a lot of information for the families and for the community. Um, I'm, I make the point that in community engagement and communication, this is going to be a very different year, we all hope. And the, the communication will be much more in person. We have to work as hard as we can to make sure our schools are welcoming for families and make sure that uh, parents and community groups are partners with us in educating our students. And we should be really thinking creatively about the lessons learned through technology. And how do we keep some of that technology and use that to our advantage so it helps our communication? Families that have challenges trying to get to the schools with transportation issues or childcare coverages, having these Zoom meetings, as much as we don't like them, they did work to our advantage in many cases. So we should look to blend as much as we can. Um, just a couple of quick questions, Mr. Chair, and some points. On, I, I, the, the one data point that I hear about achievement, I think the superintendent men mentioned that we're still struggling with our math achievement. And I, and I guess the, it, it's clear, it, it's continuously, it's with the students with disabilities, it's the English language learners, the students in low income backgrounds, and Latino students who are struggling. And I guess, are there strategic approaches that we're looking to put into place this fall to really address those concerns? Because they were very evident here in the data that we have here. So through the chair, the superintendent. Madam Superintendent. Uh, yes, through the chair. And uh, I'd just like to share that uh, last week was the superintendent's conference at the Cape. And uh, Desi held a special uh, training for all superintendents. Uh, and actually, the area of math came up as a concern across the state. Uh, and the whole the uh, way of teaching math. So first of all, we have to assess. We're not sure. Um, when we're looking at those students that took the remote testing, whether or not um, those are really where they're at. And so the first thing we have to do is test and find out where are they. Uh, the second is find out what skills they're missing and then uh, provide a way for them to gain those skills at the same time that they're learning the skills for their current grade. So uh, the the state has developed, uh, they call it the roadway to acceleration, and uh, that's what we'll be training our principals in, and that's what we'll be training our staff in before the school year starts. I, I just really, it's, the numbers that, he, that we saw tonight reflect what's really included in the Student Opportunity Act. It's the students who are not meeting those achievement levels we have to get to address those issues and bring them up to a higher level of academic achievement. And I, my other question, you just kind of preempted a little bit here. Are, are, are there, you know, the plan, what are our plans for a student assessment for August and September, and then the remediation work? I assume that's the acceleration you talked about. Yeah, so uh, through the chair, so we will be doing bench work, benchmark assessments, plus we are gonna do the STAR again. And, you know, our concern about the fourth graders, you know, as we had conversation about that, is that, they really missed from March till June of their third grade year. And uh, third grade is really essential to basic skills for math. And then their fourth grade year, uh, for most of the time, we were remote. So uh, though that particular group of students are students that we really want to give additional focus on. Uh, once, of course, uh, we verify if indeed the, the gaps occur, but we are sure that they probably did because they, they missed that second half of the of third grade. So um, for all students, not just math, each school will assess what they need from us uh, in order to provide after school uh, tutoring or tutoring during the school day for our students. And that's why we saved that uh, money in the budget this year so that we can provide individual attention uh, to each school based on the needs of their students. And then, then finally, Mr. Chair, on the area of, of diversity and hiring, I, and we will have a topic, an item tonight in the mayor's report uh, t coming out as well tonight. And I'll stress that we have to be as intentional as we can about diversifying our workforce. And it's, I think the, the, the 12 principles of color is the most important um, data point that is there. And 
the leadership in the school and trying to be as intentional there, and I, I'm glad to see that number there. I will, blame, I will also wonder about our own decision making where the diversity goal was 17%, when in school year 18, we'd hired 22%. So we gave you a goal that was actually lower than the previous years that were achieved. But I'm glad to see us making movement, making progress there, and I encourage us to be as intentional as we can. Through the, through the chair. So that goal came right from the strategic plan. Yeah. So the, the goal for this year was the 17%, and that, that's why that there came, came right from there. But um, we exceeded that, you know, to continue to exceed that goal. We weren't sticking at 17%. Uh, we are, you know, actually, um, the other day, uh, we were... Uh, discussing, uh, which we'll discuss at the school committee uh, in the future, of actually hiring a, a recruiter. Um, that's their main job. Uh, we have been working, uh, having a lot of conversations in, with Boston, and um, how do they recruit? They seem to be the most successful in recru recruiting uh, people of color in many positions, and uh, they do it actually through a uh, recruiter process, a uh, person that is a recruiter, and they keep a dashboard that was very interesting uh, to us um, that actually um, tracks um, who applies for a job, uh, who gets interviewed for a job, who receives the job, how long have they been, how long do they stay, and uh, we're very interested in, in also thinking about that position. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm Ms. Novick, followed by Mrs. Clancy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think, first of all, it's important for us as a committee to remember that this is a mid-cycle review. Um, it's not a year, it's six months. Um, we adopted these goals on the 17th of December. The data that we're being given um, is supposed to only reflect um, things that have happened since December. Um, they don't in entirely. Um, and I think that it's important for us to remember. I honestly am uncomfortable with um, our calendar on evaluation. I think it doesn't really reflect the school year. Um, my assumption, I wasn't on the committee when this decision was made, um, is that this was intended so that we could somehow tie it to MCAS scores coming back. I think this past year we've had a good reflection on how important that particularly was. Um, but it leaves us in a very awkward position, which is that, um, as I'm sure my colleagues have noted, um, every single one of these goals is actually now timed out. And we're, we're in the middle of the evaluation cycle. I also want to note for my colleagues, I know um, Mrs. Clancy has been through um, superintendent evaluation training. I, I don't think that most of my colleagues have. The mid-cycle review is actually, um, here, I'll read it right from Desi's um, document. Partway through the evaluation cycle, somewhere near the halfway point, there should be a formative assessment, a check-in on progress. This is not intended to be a written assessment, but rather a chance to discuss accomplishments to that point in time. We're not supposed to have an hour and 45 minute presentation by the superintendent. This is supposed to be, this is the data that you're supposed to have, this is the data that where we're at, that's what we're supposed to get. The reason that I asked Dr. Friel to send us the backup is that we didn't actually have the data that showed whether or not we'd met the goals in the actual presentation. We had to follow, you had to decide which link you were supposed to find and then follow it. Um, that's not what we're supposed to be getting here. And I'm very concerned that we're not steeping ourselves um, in the goals of the district the way that we're supposed to here. I, I have some comments on, in particular, the, the standards. Um, in terms of meeting the goals, the first thing I will say, Mr. Chair, is that we're going to need to redraft them. So I would suggest that we send this report probably to governance because we don't have any goals at this point. All of these expired as of June. Um, Probably something we should have thought about at the time, but nonetheless, we need to do that. In terms of the diversity information, I'm uncomfortable with the fact that all I've received um, in terms of changes is percentages. Um, there's also a discrepancy, incidentally, between the number of uh, the change net from um, 19 to 21 between the information that's given here and the information we have in the budget. Pretty significantly, actually. Um, but I'd like to know how many hires have we had, what are the actual um, positions that they're in, and so forth, rather than just sort of beginning um, percentage points. It's 
honestly less informative. And the thing that I keep coming back to on this, as well as on really the rest of what we're talking about here, is we know that um, it's not just about hiring, it's also about retention. There wasn't, there's, an, there's a, a note about retention in the goal, there wasn't any information given about retention, and frankly, um, recruitment's great, but if what we do is cycle people through, um, speaking as someone who cycled through a school district because of the culture of the district, then we're not actually achieving what we need to. I will also say I agree entirely with you, the strategic plan badly needs an update. Um, I think that the evidence given to demonstrate that the strategic plan, um, or rather that the budget supports the strategic plan, actually demonstrates that we don't start with the strategic plan when we build the budget. Um, our budget went up by $48.8 .8 million over last year. The evidence that we got is about $5 million of that. That's, not say that's saying we don't really start from there. Um, and that's a problem, because if, we're, if we say that we do that and then we don't, we're, um, that's a problem. And then also, what are we actually spending our money on if we're not spending it on the strategic plan? Um, as it happens, I think the strategic plan needs to be fixed first. The, the other thing there that I would note is that the evidence the superintendent gave us in terms of the site councils, which yes, absolutely has been an ongoing concern of mine, demonstrates that the principals are meeting with their site councils after they've had their meetings with central administration. The site councils are supposed to be meeting with the principals to inform their argument to administration when they actually do their, their, um, their meetings with central administration. So we're doing that backwards, which was my concern. I appreciate having the information. Um, but before those principals are meeting with the superintendent and the CFO and everyone else downtown, they need to be having the meeting with their teachers and their parents and their students to say, what is it that we actually need this year? Um, that's actually going to, among other things, strengthen the hand of the principals. I will also say, um, and I appreciate Mrs. Clancy checking my memory on this, the comparison on the district goal three was actually not the one that we requested. When we talked about this in governance, what we asked for was that we recreate group C in 2019 data, not look at the actual students that we had that were group C now that we had had in 2019. Um, yes, that would be the apples to apples comparison. We know that things like student discipline changes over time in terms of how many grades kids are with us. That would actually be the meaningful comparison. I also do feel just in you know, all honesty because this is actually something that's out there in the universe, the chart that backs this up that talks about the comparison of group C discipline that claims that it's an 100% reduction it's a 14% disciplinary rate in 2019. It's a 2% disciplinary rate in 2021. That's not a 100% reduction. Yes, none of those same kids were, were um, suspended, but we did have kids who were suspended. So let's, I, I, I first of all don't like the chart anyway because it doesn't actually have an X and a Y in access. It doesn't have any data on it. But secondly, let's not claim 100% reduction when we don't have one. To go into the standards. Um, I agree with what Mr. Foley said in terms of I've been very uncomfortable with what we're doing in terms of summertime and what I see with us coming up for next year. Um, this information should be informing, but honestly it should have already informed what we were doing for summertime. Those were the students that we should have gone and, re and directly recruited for summer programs. That's something that other districts did. That isn't something that we did and that concerns me because I think we're losing an opportunity here. And I do expect us to hear updates about what resources we're devoting to closing those gaps. Um, in terms of standard two and human resources management and development, um, my understanding is that we have a number of contracts that are not updated. Um, through the chair to administration, would we have any idea how many contracts there are that currently are in abeyance with individuals, not with um, collective bargaining units? Um, through the chair. Um, what kind of contracts? Contracts with individuals who work for us, like administrators. With principals or? Principals, central administrators. So um, we are working on the contracts. I, I'd have to, I want to say, um, we'll have to ask, oh, there she is, uh, Jennifer Boulay to answer that. Uh, through the chair to Connell Novak. Um, 
say that we have approximately 15 people who um, do need updated written contracts, but we would have zero that are expired. Our principal contracts, uh, as you probably know from your work in the industry, principals have an automatic one-year extension if the district does not notify them in writing in a, a very specific timely manner that they will not be um, renewed. And we have not notified any principals, so they all did get the additional rollover. The principals who are, are waiting for updated documents to reflect that, um, we have been in contact with them and we were awaiting the resolution of the budget because we did want to make sure that the documents that we shared with them were accurate in terms of salary. So there are zero principals and administrators who are not currently under contract, but there are some who are, are awaiting updated documents. Can I, thank you. My understanding is that when you start including those beyond principals, it gets up to more like over 20, which considering how many people we have that have direct um, contracts with the superintendent um, is fairly significant. Um, I will note that, I mean, a quick glance at our own agenda demonstrates the level of commitment the school committee has to ensuring that our contracts are up to date. Um, I think that leaving people hanging, um, particularly when we have people who effectively are at-will employees, um, is not professional. Um, I also will note, by the way, that um, at-will employees are particularly vulnerable um, to coercive action and that um, demonstrations um, of their opinions thus um, are subject to being tampered with. Um, and I will take that in light both of tonight and other times. Um, several of us in terms of fiscal systems raised concerns at our final meeting about the budget around grant management. Um, and I want to remind my colleagues that we had a report fairly early on in this term that we're returning, or at least we had our history over the past five years, of returning um, $200,000 or more to the state um, in terms of grants that weren't actually expended in the timely fashion. Um, I first would ask that we receive an update of that report. That was up through FY19. I would ask that we receive an updated grants report on the grant, grant amounts received, expended, and the amount returned for both FY20 and FY21. Um, the superintendent indicated at our budget meeting um, that she did not intend to make any changes in fiscal in grant management. Um, and I just want to express my concern again um, at a time when we're receiving $120 million from the federal government that um, we need to make sure that we actually, among other things, actually spend it all. Um, the final point I'll make, Mr. Chair, is this, that um, we, there's an extensive list here, um, and it is a list, um, around communication. But the goal is actually culturally competent two-way communication. I continue to have concerns about cultural competency, um, but in particular, the thing that I want to note is that the number of things here that were two-way communication where people could talk to us and we had to listen were pretty much limited, as Mr. Foley noted, um, to the parental forums where people talked to us. Um, we emit a lot. We send a lot. We talk a lot. Um, but if that's most or just about all you ever do, you effectively are talking at people. And the state's standard quite deliberately is intended to be about two-way communication. And I'll note, Mr. Chair, that the family engagement portion of this actually reads, all families are welcome members of the classroom and school community and can contribute to the effectiveness of the classroom, school, district, and community. I don't know that that's actually the mission and vision of the Worcester Public Schools at this point. Um, it is, however, supposed to be what we're doing. Um, and I know that I've received, and I know I'm not alone, um, continued community concern um, about the resistance of this administration about community engagement, um, and continued family concern about the resistance of this administration um, to families being meaningful engaged in their children's education. So um, I appreciate the update. Um, I assume we'll have work ahead of us in governance to come up with a new set of goals. Um, I would um, flag those things as being of concern. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Clancy? Thank you. Um, Ms. Novick actually hit on a couple of things, but I will, so I might be a little redundant, but there are some things that I would like to express. Um, again, administration, principals, teachers, I can't thank you enough the year that you had. It was an incredible year. We made it through, but now we have to start focusing on our next school year, which I think is gonna be just as complicated as the one that we just finished. Um, so my one, I do, like Ms. Novick just said, regarding the professional practice goal, again, there's a lot of communication that we put out, we put out, but I wanna make sure that it's effective, and that's my, my concern, is that families are getting effective communication, because it seemed every time we held a forum or you know, phone calls were put out, I would get five phone calls or five emails back, and I just wanna make sure that, and we, I mean, we made a little joke about it that, you know, the, the Connect Ed calls, but sometimes I think we sent so many out that so many just got ignored. Um, so effective communication is more important to me than how much we are sending out communication to the families. So that's one thing that I would like to, you know, see done. And I also think that the public forums, the two-way communication, and the, the first couple of ones that we had, the answering of the questions, is definitely something that we're going to need to continue um, going forward. The other thing as, you know, Ms. Novick, you know, stated, and I have some concerns around is regarding our diversity hires. Um, it seems that we did 33 teachers, 12 staff and administration, and that's wonderful. I think our goal, you know, for our district is to have people of color in front of our students. So there's 60 positions, new hires that I would like to see a breakdown of and to see what positions that they're in, because we want to make sure, you know, that we have people in front of our students. Um, so that's just the other thing I had. And so if I could just get a breakdown of the, you know, the, the 60 positions that are still, that aren't listed on that form. You know, like I said, other than that, I think, you know, it's, it's good. There is some, still some work to be done. And I look forward to this year and seeing where we're going forward. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Bean Carrier. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, let's see. First, I would like to say um, congratulations to everyone, um, our staff at Worcester Public Schools, um, administration, teachers, our custodians, our lunch people, our nurses, um, people who work in our school on safety, our accounting, everybody, IT department, outstanding, unbelievable. And um, we have been uh, through with the rest of the world, not just the country, but the rest of the world, an amazing year. But we were able to educate. We were able to provide training. We were able to have many developed avenues that were beneficial. We need to learn some lessons from those and combine them. So when we look forward to the challenging year that we're moving into, we haven't arrived there yet, we're moving into, um, we have the best education possible for our kids. And I say our kids because that's our community. I had the honor of attending as many graduations as I possibly could. And um, I asked for the number tonight, and it's on the sheet here, and there were 1,660 graduates. I think that was the only number that wasn't in our report. And yes, there's a lot of pages. And yes, um, I think we're all pretty much working technical pieces of this, and we were able to look at the data and be able to research it. and take a look at what the um, papers had to say, what our administration had to tell us. And uh, do we have some challenges? Absolutely. Do we have things that need to be uh, tweaked? Sure. If we didn't, we wouldn't be running one of the largest districts that is successful. Because we not only are educating our kids, but we are helping our homeless students. We also provided clothing when necessary. We helped people with housing. We fed our community. Um, we did a great deal. So our commitment 
of not only working with our city council as our mayor, our city manager, our superintendent, and the staff so graciously that are here, some of them are here this evening, were able to not only see the progress of what it is to be on a team that has their engine on the right track, but also looking at what we need to do and what the value of our success stories. So yes, there was a tremendous amount of reading for our mid-cycle, but pardon the expression, we all had one hell of a year. We all had one hell of the last six months. Whether you want to count it as 12 months or six months is irrelevant to me due to the fact that when I look at the goals, what the strategic plan was established, what we had anticipated as school committee members and as a community to ensure that we had budget, accountability, safety, advances in Chapter 74, and that that was accomplished using remote engagement. We translated, and every year I'd be the first to say, step up and say that I've asked about translation in the budget, why it costs million, two million, four hundred thousand. Well, now we know why. Because we got to talk to a lot of people. A lot of people who live in our great city. And the only way we can keep our city great is by working together as a team, looking at what the strategies need to be to overcome the challenges that we can anticipate. But also, we're going to have challenges, as we stated this evening. We may be in a different situation in September. We may be looking at our schools in a different situation. So we have to be ready and prepared. So yes, we do have to combine what our lessons were learned over the last six months. But when I look at 1,660 students that crossed the stage at Polar Park to get their diploma, they were not only educated, they looked happy. They looked happy at the fact that they were moving forward. And that's what we did. We did not stay still. We did not step backwards. We moved forward under challenges that I don't think anyone, not only in this room, but anyone who was listening or watching, could have predicted 18 months ago. So when we look at our collaborative effort, we also have to look at one of the pieces that was mentioned tonight, collaborative problem solving. So as we move forward, let's look for our solutions. Let's look to make sure we continue to discuss what our challenges are going to be, that we keep communication, that we look for the accountability, that we keep our schools safe, and we have the engagement that includes everyone. Because we're going to have a budget that is going to be very unusual. That's all we hear is we're going to be getting additional money. We're going to be getting additional money. It was in the paper on what the city planned on doing and so on and so forth as far as how we're going to be monitoring it. So I think we have a lot of team members that are very experienced well-educated, well-versed, um, and they value their positions. And I ha know that Craig Barnes, who works in the grants department, when you call him and ask him a question, he's right there to give you an answer. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't turn around and forget to call you back. He gets back to you. He answers the questions. Many years ago, I worked in the grants department, was involved in that. It's an experience. It provides not only numbers and funding, but activities. And again, it also makes you sit down and develop how a team is going to accomplish what needs to be done to ensure that we continue, again, on the right track 
we have the right values, and we have endless opportunities. We have a great city. We have a school system that always will have challenges. We have a city that will always have challenges. But when we look at the last couple of weeks in June, and kids got their diplomas, and they're going on to the numerous listing of colleges, they're going on to careers to support their family, going in to serve our country. They looked proud, and we should be proud of what we did. We should be very, very proud. We had one hell of a year. We had one hell of a six months. So as we move forward, I look forward to the accountability, the budgeting, the safety in our schools, the engagement, Chapter 74, and the professional development needs to continue. The engagement needs to be there, and we can get it done. We have a radio show. <laughs> I think that's kind of comical, I'm sorry, because I didn't know anybody listened to the radio anymore. <laughs> Everybody has all different mechanics and, and tech work, but that's okay. I think that's a great idea. Good luck to you. There were many acronyms that we used tonight that I made notes of, and I'm going to be looking up a few of them. Um, but as far as an overview, let me just say this again. Thank you to everyone, teachers, custodians, all the staff that have worked, the IT department, everybody. Um, there have been many challenges. We looked at all of this. We look at our kids. But um, I'm very proud of our city. I'm pr very proud of what we've accomplished. Um, and it's definitely an honor to stand here tonight and take a look at a mid-cycle that uh, provided education and engagement for our community. Thank you. Thank you. So we will send that report to uh, governance. And, um, and also, we should probably look at that. I think the superintendent would agree. I know. Ms. Novick brought up maybe changing the dates of the, how the evaluation works. So this year end, is it better to do it in June or to do the mid-year, mid-cycle in uh, the way we're doing it now? It seems to be off, that uh, yeah, so we're always behind. I yeah, know we talked about the it before. Through year, I think, uh, through the pandemic, we got off cycle. You know, uh, even before that, I think, the year before, I thought. Last yeah. year, the mid-year wasn't. Not the year before, the mid year was in December and the final in June, so that we could inform the district goals of the principals uh, also for their evaluation and for the teachers. We should so have that discussion. There was a way to was, get yeah. back on um, target that would be great. Okay. okay the, and also, the reports are asked for. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. We are going to personnel. We are going to file personnel. What's that? What's that? Sure. Just your name and say your residence. Uh, Megan Marslack. I am a Worcester resident. Thank you. Uh, you can speak right into the microphone. So can... My name is Megan Marslack. Um, and like Superintendent Benenda, I'm born and raised in Worcester. I still live in the city with my husband, who's a Worcester firefighter, and our two children, um, both of whom are Worcester Public Schools students. Um, so my son is entering fourth grade. He loves ST math, by the way, um, which I know because I'm more engaged in what he's actually doing in school now than I ever was. Um, and my daughter will be attending preschool at the New South High in the fall. Um, so when I heard there was a, a mid-year review today, I just wanted to come down and provide a parent perspective to kind of go along with all the procedure and data that you guys have been talking about. So thank you for allowing me time to express how impressed I've been with Superintendent Benenda's leadership over the past couple of years, particularly during the pandemic. Um, I've greatly appreciated Mrs. Benenda's 
transparency through these uncertain times. She was able to engage parents and members of the community in new ways to keep us informed and answer our questions. As we've heard a lot tonight, any parent of a Worcester Public Schools student can tell you about the Connect Ed messages. Um, lots of us found them annoying, uh, but they really were critical in easing my worries, and I'm sure a lot of other parents too. Um, worries not just regarding educational models, but also accessing critical community resources such as where to pick up free food um, and meals that fed our families. From my vantage point, no stone went unturned in making sure our students had the resources they needed to receive a quality education through the pandemic. Superintendent Benenda and her administration facilitated the distribution of computers and enhanced internet connectivity to communities most in need. That not only had a positive impact on student learning, but expanded connectivity will continue to have exponential impact on our communities well into the future. Last summer, I was pleased to see the committee praise Superintendent Benenda for her job well done leading the district through the crisis, as many of you did again tonight. Uh, as we all know, the crisis is not over, and after a year and a half of so much uncertainty, our teachers, principals, staff, and students deserve the steady leadership of Superintendent Benenda. And likewise, Superintendent Benenda deserves the opportunity to continue these impressive uh, results and progress that she's made. Thanks. I'll wrap up with one final thought. Yeah, it's a simple one, but I think it really makes all the difference. Superintendent Benenda loves this city. Her deep love of place for Worcester and the district students is evident. Um, the statistics presented tonight really prove that. That type of genuine care and passion for the work is not easy to come by, and we're really, truly fortunate to have uh, Superintendent Benenda leading our district. So thank you thank for your you. time. Thank you. Um, you want to say something, Mr. Thunderjian? Yes, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> a couple minutes yep, not long at all not long at all thank you very much uh mayor petty superintendent benenda dr friel members of the school committee um as you know i'm roger nugent president of the education association of worcester i am here tonight on behalf of every eaw member to voice of uh frustration with the delays in settling a fair contract our previous contract expired more than a year ago, and since then you have seen our public school educators perform outstanding work during the most challenging times that most of us have ever seen. Our schools form the backbone of this city. That was on display throughout the pandemic. Educators made every effort to meet the needs of students, navigating new practices to ensure that children stay connected to school, while we all work together to protect the health and safety of our families. Rising to the challenge is what members of the Education Association of Worcester do. The pandemic has taught us how important it is to have a skilled and committed workforce in our public schools. The lack of a contract, the slow pace of settling a new contract, and the lackluster proposals that the district is bringing to the table all threaten to undermine the quality of our public schools. Districts across the state are bracing for shortages of teachers and school staff, just as businesses and other professions are experiencing work, worker shortages because of the pandemic. The federal government has provided more than $120 million to Worcester and its schools to address the impacts of the pandemic. The state is on track to fully fund the Stu Student Opportunity Act and increase the funding given to our schools. We must use these investments to the benefit of our students, and there is no greater resource for our students than an excellent teaching force. The EAW is seeking a fair contract that acknowledges the experience and the dedication of the educators currently working in the district and that will continue to attract highly skilled educators. 
We need a contract that not only addresses the current conditions in our schools, but one that also anticipates near-term and long-term needs. The AW is pre prepared to bargain and settle a contract that would just justly reflect our members' commitment to the Worcester Public Schools, and that will ensure that Worcester can provide the best possible education to every student attending our schools today and in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we are uh, going back to the agenda. We're going to personnel. Members file personnel items 2-21 to 1-22. Those in favor, opposed, so ordered. Uh, we did 1-137.1. We are on response to the administration to request to hold C and D for discussion for the July 22nd, 2021 meeting. And this is the reports on the bus drivers and the federal grants. I know Mr. Foley is going to have a meeting on buses, I think, August 18th. Mr. Foley, is that right? <laughs> on the uh, on the buses, you're going to have a meeting on the finance committee meeting. That'd be a great reference. Thank you. Oh, is, is we have a meeting scheduled already for August 17th, I think, Dr. Friel. But we can we can check it and it's an announce it anyways. Okay, because we have to just sort of yeah, we're going to have to take a vote probably uh, probably sometime in September, I would think. But in August on the buses. And uh, Ms. Novick? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the referral. That was what I was going to ask for. Okay, sorry um, about I, that. I did, <laughs> nope, but being anticipated on referrals is, no, is not a problem. Um, I did wonder if there was any update uh, through the chair to administration in terms of the, um, the holes that we had in terms of bus drivers through Durham. Thank you, Ms. Mendoza. Uh, yes, uh, through the chair. Um, so one good thing, uh, what well, maybe it's not a good thing, but uh, is that uh, we're no longer going to be transporting the charter school. So there were ten buses that we used to transport the charter schools. Um, granted that uh, because they've got another bus company that they've gone with, um, so those ten buses did transport also some of our other students in the tiers. However, that's going to offer us additional flexibility. So uh, prior to knowing that, um, there were my conversation yesterday uh, with Durham is that uh, they were six to eight uh, bus drivers shot. Um, however, now we'll have to look at the flexibility of those uh, routes now that we're no longer doing the charter school. So right now they have seven to 10 licensed drivers that will be ready to drive in three weeks. Uh, right now, they're looking to hire 26 additional drivers. Um, they are now giving sign-on bonuses. They have offered competitive um, salaries to other vendors. And uh, they're you know, willing to uh, work with us um, to continue to uh, recruit. Um, so that's it. So we're, you know, this six, maybe six to eight, what did I say? Six to eight. Short, um, but I look, talked to Mr. Hennessy yesterday and asked if they, we could look to, um, just in case the six day drivers, we don't, uh, they're not able to get them, uh, if we're able to some, combine some routes, especially now that we don't have the charter school. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I mean, learning for that, I just want to make sure that I've got my terminology right. Uh, learning first, which was Seven Hills, would have had what I believe we refer to as trips. As you say, they're buses that already would have been transporting our students in other tiers. Um, so that possibly frees up that, although I'm wondering exactly how many students that was. I know how, how big the school is. If we're short six to eight, if, oh, actually, sorry, let me back up a step. That's what Durham is short. Um, through the chair of the administration, is there any update necessary in terms of where the Worcester Public Schools transportation is? Are we short any drivers? The microphone's on. Huh? Maury. Mr. Allen? Your microphone's on. 
Mr. Allen. To the chair, um, we are uh, experienced a couple of retirements over the summer, and um, we're in the process of pulling civil service list and hiring uh, to backfill those positions in time for the start of the school year. Okay, and uh, through the chair of the administration, my understanding is that we've been able to pull off the civil service list without that actually being, leaving us with gaps, is that the case? I'm sorry, can you re say that, the question that again? We don't anticipate this being something where we say that we're going to pull off the civil service list but still end up with a gap. Is that an accurate the reflection? Plan would be the, yes, the plan would be to fill all of our positions through uh, the civil service process. Uh, okay, thank you. So um, by my math, if Durham is six to eight drivers short, um, if each of our if each of our buses runs three tiers in the morning and three tiers in the afternoon, that's at least 18 trips that were short. Um, we know that some buses are full and some buses are not full, so let's not assume that each bus is going to have 60 kids on it. But I'm getting up over 100 pretty quickly here, Mr. Chair, in terms of the number of families that are impacted, um, and I don't think that that's going to be picked up by the 10 trips that were short. Um, so I appreciate that Mr. Foley's gonna have a meeting. Um, I would ask that um, that meeting please address um, transportation for this year, but transportation after this year as well. Um, and then also, and, and this is I think my particular concern right now, plans to get through this year um, while making plans for the future. Um, in other words, if there are adjustments that we need to be making, frankly, even in August, um, to fill whatever gaps there are, um, I would like us to be giving our transportation the ability to do that. Um, I'd also make a request, um, well, I, I know that Mrs. Clancy and I both have seen it, um, if we could again have the backup um, that the prior committee received um, regarding um, in-district transportation. Um, I would appreciate it, and I would appreciate, I'd, ask, I'd make a motion um, asking if we could get an update reflecting what would happen to those projections um, if, as was in the budget response, we actually moved ahead with using ESSER funds to purchase buses. Um, I know that that would have a financial impact on those out years, um, and I'd be interested in what that looked like. Um, and incidentally, Mr. Chair, I just want to note that um, yesterday the city of Brockton um, took delivery of um, something like 60 buses because they've moved to in-district transportation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Madam Superintendent. Um, that's true about Brockton, but they're also now involved in a lawsuit uh, with the, co the company that um, does their current transportation. So um, also uh, we did meet, uh, we did have a conversation about this, uh, Mr. Allen and our um, leadership team uh, regarding that the way we have the budget done, um, there is no available funding uh, available for purchase of buses at this time uh, based on the budget that we have proceeded out. Uh, and the guidelines uh, set on the buses are, are really uh, pretty clear. Um, there are certain conditions you have to meet in, in, in order to use uh, ESSER money for, for buses. So I do think that we need to be careful with that. Um, we know that this is federal money and that uh, we are going to be accountable at a much higher level uh, for every spending that we make on that. Yeah, Mr. Chair, through the chair to the, super, uh, the superintendent, um, I'm well aware of that, which is why I'm concerned about our grant allocation and oversight. Um, we only allocated $40 million of $120 million in ESSER funding. We still have at least $80 million to go, and actually we didn't do line item detail even of the $40 million. So no, we've got plenty of money left. Um, also, um, in the backup that your administration was kind enough to give us during the budget deliberation, we actually received all of the information about the delineation around what it would require in order to do that. And one of the main concerns that both the federal and the state government have are time on learning and equity, both of which are directly impacted when our kids can't get to school, which has been the main reason that I keep bringing up transportation. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll send that to uh, this, these reports to finance. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. Let's see. Response to the administration request to provide the number of 2021 high school graduates to include the colleges that the students plan to attend. That's from the administration. Ms. B. Carrier. Jack. We can combine that with um, GB1170, sir. One right below it. Response to administration to request to provide the number of seniors by site who receive certificates of attainment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Those two items certainly um, go hand in hand. We had 1,660 students, three of which received a certificate of attainment. Um, the rest received their diplomas. And question would be um, the kids that receive the certificate of attainment, are we still working with them so perhaps they can um, receive their diploma through the chair of administration? Superintendent. Oh, what's going on? Okay, uh, through the chair. So uh, depending upon, I don't know what schools those are from looking at that, I'll have to look that up. But sure. um, basically um, how it usually works is the uh, principals uh, work with, whether it's the special ed person to work with the students to help them pass the you know, MCAS if uh, that's, what the issue was for their certificate of attainment mm -hmm. uh, provide. Uh, during the summer, we have a lot of students that are coming in and working uh, to try to complete the work that they need to do. And then, of course, if it's an MCAS, we'll have to wait uh, until the next MCAS mm -hmm. to see where, where we're at with that. Well, I certainly wish those graduates, um, all of the graduates, much success and um, hope some of them stick around in Worcester. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ms. Biancari. And uh, we need a motion, Dr. Freel, I think, to file 1-169.1 uh, and 1-170.1. All in favor, approve, so voted. Uh, next item, 1-171.1 from uh, Ms. Biancari, Ms. McCullough, Mr. Monfrido, Ms. Novick. It's the response of the administration to the request to provide the number of students enrolled in the freshman class at Worcester Technical High School and include both the number that applied and those on the waiting list. Ms. Biancaria. Thank you for this information. Um, I continue and will always continue to highlight uh, Chapter 74 schools, what we have to offer. Um, and when I look at Worcester Technical High School, right now we have 464 students on a waiting list. Um, and, and some may look at this like, this is you know terrific. We have so many kids that are interested. I look at this as we're shot on letting our kids know we have chapter 74 in other schools. Um, we need to get that out there more and more, not only with the students, but with the parents. We also need to work on how we can increase the number of students. Now, we spoke of this a couple of years ago where we were going to increase our, uh, each class by a number of students. Uh, what, not, so it's not just a bulk in one area. If we could review that, Superintendent, To the superintendent. Uh, through the chair, so uh, the total number uh, for Worcester Tech, uh, we would, we had small number students last year because some students chose not to go because it was gonna be a remote year. But each year, if we accept this number that we accepted this year, uh, then uh, that would be full. Our obligation in building the tech school would be complete to continue every single year accepting that number of students. See, the challenge right now is that you cannot enter in your sophomore, junior, or senior year, right? So we have some numbers uh, simply because people chose last year not to attend. The other piece of this is always keep in mind when a student 
for whatever reason, is asked to exit Worcester Technical High School. Um, we don't have that ability in our comprehensive high schools to ask a student to exit our high school. But however, they are brought um, back and there are times that students at Worcester Technical High School are then told that they have to go back to the comprehensive high school. When there is an opening of that and a student does exit in that manner, do we fill that position or do we leave it empty? Superintendent. So through the chair, uh, you can't fill that position because the students have missed their hours in their trade. So, uh, but however, um, that practice has stopped uh, for about three years now. Uh, we no longer, if, if there's a student that might have to exit, uh, the only place they would go to the Gerald Creamer Center, uh, maybe to take some academic classes, um, but they're still able to access their trade. So uh, we, that doesn't occur as much as it did in past years, where students, for example, that had large discipline issues may no longer be able to stay at Worcester Tech. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. So the only students that may exit would be seniors uh, who are maybe have failed too many classes and are unable to get that high school diploma and they would go to the Gerald Kramer Center. And we would never replace, uh, put a person in as a senior. As we look for um, the next stages of how we're looking at chapter 74, um, in what we have to offer, I just make a motion that we once again receive an updated list of the Chapter 74 courses that are offered in all of our schools, labeling the school, and then the specific Chapter 74. Um, now we're going into South High School in September. We have a new high school. Can we review once again, please, what is going to be offered under Chapter 74 into the new South High Community School? Superintendent Benenda. Through the chair, uh, so auto diesel uh, is one of the very unique programs that's not offered anywhere um, in this area. Uh, Rhode Island does have a uh, diesel program. Uh, actually, and I think maybe Fall River also does those too. Uh, but there's not any diesel program around this area. So that's one. Uh, culinary arts, and, and I just have to say that I went to see that kitchen last week, and it is superb. It is better than any kitchen I've seen in a restaurant. It has everything you can imagine in that culinary kitchen there. And then uh, early childhood, which is connected um, also to the infant toddler program and the two preschools. So you're gonna be able to get your certificate in infant toddler as well as in, you know, um, preschool. So it's a great opportunity. The other place that that preschool one is taught in culinary only uh, at this point is Worcester Tech. So when we look at our chapter 74 courses that are coming up, these students, 464 students that are on a waiting list, um, they're throughout the city. Yeah. So they are looking at hearing, so they're listening tonight, they say, you know what, I would like to go to that culinary at South High. What is their opportunity, Superintendent, and what is their process? To the superintendent. Through, through the chair. Uh, so they would just have to um, contact the principal, Jeff Creamer of South High, and uh, apply. There's an application to apply for Chapter 74 programs, uh, both the ones at North, Doherty, and South. And another important component that um, is very successful, and um, we actually just had uh, Kelsey Lamro from Mass Hire come on with us, uh, which was a great, a great hire, is the Innovative Pathway Program. So our Innovative Pathway Program is an opportunity for kids to go to their comprehensive high school and in the afternoons go to Worcester Tech and get those certifications. That's a very strong program more students should take advantage of. And the number of students that can take advantage of that particular avenue? So each high school, uh, it's really not um, limited, each high school uh, can send students to that program. Right now, I think we started, I think we're over 200 students in that program now and looking to uh, expand it. 
And uh, when we look at professional development for our counselors and our schools and our guidance counselors um, and our teachers, is there any information in reference to the Chapter 74's courses that are available, not just at Worcester Tech, but at our other sites, that is brought to their attention? Uh, yep, through the chair. So um, we are reimagining um, our high schools right now and our work with the Bar Foundation. So uh, part of that work is the um, portrait of a graduate. So what can we expect from elementary to middle to high school? Uh, that work has been done in the middle and the high schools now. And part of that work is the key role of the guidance counselor and the mask model in um, helping prepare our students and let families families also about the many opportunities that we offer. So we are continuing to work in that area. Because as we know, part of the application and part of the reason some of these kids are on the waiting list is when their counselor fills out their application and fills out their form, they're rated, their numbers that um, didn't meet what a 95 or a 96, they may be down in 85. And when that makes a difference on who gets accepted at Worcester Technical High School. So as we move forward, I would like to think that um, we are not only educating our kids and our parents, but our staff, so they, this is a selling point for all of our students, for all of our sites, to then be able to say that you can make um, your application at Worcester Tech. However, if you're on the waiting list and you are number 325, then you have an opportunity to perhaps go to another school. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be in your neighborhood, but you have that opportunity, or you have to, an opportunity to go after school to find um, what you may like up at Worcester Tech and be able to get your certification and get some hands-on experiences through that. So oh. what... When I look at this particular item, um, I certainly appreciate the fact that they have um, a number of students through the halls at Worcester Technical High School. But again, my concern was the right. 464 kids that are looking to attend Worcester Technical High School. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping that at some point we can come up with some process where if they are on a waiting list, they receive some type of um, letter, brochure, that shows them and explains to them what our other schools are. So that'll be at a later date that I'll put something on the agenda for that because I think the kids that are on that waiting list, I hear from many of them because of their interest and I try to express um, the, the idea that we have other opportunities um, for these kids and it's certainly, I, I feel it very, very important. Thank you. Um, through the um, chair, can I also also um, bring back the item to the school committee regarding the change of the acceptance policy for Worcester Tech, uh, which we will be presenting to this committee for approval. So um, some of the concerns of parents uh, regarding, uh, so only the kids with the 95s get in, uh, certainly will be addressed. And as far as the form that the guidance counselor fills out, um, the rule for this year and last year, what was a little more difficult this year because some kids were still remote, is that it has to be done as a team. So the student uh, and the team teachers, because all middle schools are teamed, and the guidance counselor fill that out together. So instead of a trained guidance counselor that knows how to check the right boxes and say what needs to be said, it has to be a team approach now for that, uh, for the guidance form that does come in. However, there's changes now in the area of discipline attendance uh, in grades also for the new attendance policy. I look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Ms. Novick. That was actually exactly what I was going to ask about, so thank you, Madam Superintendent. Um, it, what I, th that item is actually in my subcommittee. I don't know how we want to take that. Um, it, the reason that I, that I stand to address this item is I would be interested in what the demographics of the data is that we just received, data are that we just received, um, because that, of course, has been the entire sort of state 
conversation has been not only what the student body looks like, but also what happens in every step of the way. What does the student body look like that could be applying? Who then applies? Who then is admitted? And who then choose to, choose, chooses to matriculate? The state has been tracking um, the demographics of each of those groups and coming to some interesting conclusions in terms of what happens over time. I realize to your point, Madam Superintendent, that obviously this is a non-representative year, as we are going to continue to say from henceforth and forward. Nonetheless, I would be interested in, in what that looks like in terms of how that breaks out. Um, I will also say, just to sort of put a card on the table already, um, that I was interested in some of the proposals that were being made by some of the other public bodies in terms of what the state ought to have been doing. Um, rather than what the state actually did, because the state opens the door to being even more inclusive um, in terms of how your admission looks like. Um, and I think that we have a responsibility as the school committee that runs, uh, that has oversight of a technical high school that also is in a district. Um, we're unusual in that, alone with only Boston and Springfield, I believe. Um, and I think that that gives us an extra measure of making sure that Worcester Tech meets the needs of the city of Worcester, um, whereas the regional Votex, I think, can more think into, of themselves in terms of just their one, one little school. Um, so look forward to that report. Happy to take it wherever it's necessary. Um, but I do think that one of the things we need to be careful about is really looking through that tracking of the demographic data. Thank you. Uh, Madam Superintendent. Here. Um, so in the development of our plan uh, to change the acceptance policy for Worcester State, uh, we uh, were able to run the data uh, from all the past years and check to see how many L's were accepted. Um, how, was it discipline uh, that, you know, we were able to take each item and see what was it that prevented, say, um, all students from getting in, or what was that area that that helped students get in? So we uh, are in the process of running this year's acceptances, and uh, we find that data fascinating from looking at last year's. And uh, the new way of uh, doing it that uh, we have developed actually did increase um, non-traditional, I, I would say, students from going to Worcester Tech, but also uh, the inclus inclusion of more L students uh, getting accepted uh, to Worcester Tech. Okay, thank you. So we will, uh, we can file that or, okay. We want that. Is that, part, yeah, should that come to school and student performance so that we can have the discussion? Well, where, where would you anticipate the referral going for the change in? Uh, the, uh, through the chair, that would be fine with me, uh, as long as then it could go out to committee and get a vote so that we can mm -hmm. submit it to the state. Right, it's just, I was figuring that whatever we were doing in terms of admissions policy, we'd send to subcommittee anyway. Okay, so we'll thank you. So send that to committee. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. I request that the school committee consider canceling the meeting on Thursday, November 4th, 2021. Ms. Bean Carrier. Considering the fact that a number of us will be going to a conference down at Cape Cod, on that, uh, starting that Wednesday on November 3rd. I'm asking that we either reschedule it if um, that's gonna be a problem if, or uh, straight out cancel the meeting. Okay, we, let's uh, cancel the meeting, then if we have to add one, we will at that time. Okay, sounds good. Okay, Ms. Novick. People don't wanna keep up my tradition of going down and back. That's what I've always done. Um, Thank you, I appreciate that. That will make my life easier too. Um, the one thing I did wanna call to my colleagues' attention though was um, September 16th, when we have a meeting scheduled, is Yom Kippur. Um, and is it? Yes, it is. So we, I think in terms, while we're looking at our calendar, I don't have that opinion, we can move it wherever people would like to, but I think we probably should um, understand that it's an important holiday for many. Then we'll have this clerk look at that and make a recommendation. Great, thank you. Whether we, uh, Reschedule it or just cancel it? September. Probably reschedule it, I would guess. Depending on, I'm not sure. We meet August 28th. How many meetings in September do we have? Just, just two? Lots one. and lots of right. yeah, you can't can't one. 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 Yeah. Okay. We'll just see if we can reschedule that one. 
Okay, we send that to the clerk. Are those in favor opposed? So ordered. We have September 2nd. September 16th. Oh, we have one in the second? We have the second. Okay. And you have the 16th. Request that the administration provide a report in August on the summer school programs to include academic progress, attendance, community involvement, number of ELL students, number of grades one through uh, one and two students. Mr. Uh, Monfredo. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this, this year, uh, summer schools have been a, certainly been a challenge for both staff and students um, actually looking for a break from the pandemic. So I do appreciate uh, the results uh, coming uh, next month on the report. However, let's stop and evaluate uh, the items as listed in the agenda and look for ways to expand summer school opportunities. Research for decades has confirmed that summer loss, especially among our low-income students, does take place if they are not engaged in summer learning. Thus, they are likely to start school behind and face ongoing struggles to catch up. Uh, and again, this is where the achievement gap widens. Uh, come next year, as a school system and as a community, let's continue to look for additional ways for us to expand summer learning. Summer school uh, can't be an afterthought. And I know that uh, we need to look for assistance from the community. We need to consider and, requ and request now and give additional summer school expansions with the community uh, due consideration. So I would appreciate it if uh, this item uh, come August uh, that we come up with a tentative plan of how we can improve summer learning for next year. Thank you. Thank you. Those in favor, we refer that to the administration. Those in favor, opposed, so ordered. Set the date to recognize students from the Worcester Technical High School who received the gold medals uh, in Career Pathways Health uh, Services in the 2021 Skills USA National Leadership and Skills Conference that by Ms. McCullough. So set the date for Thursday, September 16th, or if it's subject to change, 2021. <coughs> All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. I uh, request that the administration provide the number of consultants or advisors that are uh, under capital expenditures, grants, or other funding. Ms. Bean Carrier. As it reads me. All those in favor, refer that to the administration. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. Request that the administration adopt SMART 911 program for all WPS building sites. Ms. Bean Carrier. This has to do with safety of our schools, our students, and our staff. So I look forward to hearing from administration on this. I think it's um, a program that comes highly recommended. Um, it's going to administration, and when it comes back, I, I assume that it will be a full package of not only the information, but if there is what the cost would be for two or three years. Is that how we're going to, through the chair to the administration? Does that sound as though it's something you would put together? Um, who would that be? Yeah, through the chair, we can Absolutely. do that. The answer is yes. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, Ms. Novick? Uh, could I consider that, could I suggest that we recast the item? Because what the item says is request the administration adopt. If what we're looking for is a report, could we instead say that we're asking for a report, please? So, okay, so Ms. Bean Carrier? I'd like to get the reports. Uh, people like to know what we're voting on, I guess. I, I am looking to, for us to adopt the uh, program, but I certainly don't have a problem with having it reviewed by administration prior to adopting. Put in that word. School committee would like to review it. Um, Mr. Bazella, do you want? Because we don't, some people don't know what this sure. is. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the SMART 911 program is a program that the city manager and the city was to have uh, started to adopt. And it is a program that uh, where a lot of uh, information is being stored into software, a software program where in the event uh, dispatch gets contacted by a particular individual in a certain building, then they will be able to know, for instance, where a number of things are in, the, in that building that's crucial to respond to the event. An AED, the location of the AED, where's the shutoff in the building, and things like that where public safety can act very uh, quickly and, re and respond accordingly. 
So uh, we were asked by the city manager if we could uh, go into a presentation with the company's name is Rave, and they are the ones who are spearheading this smart 911 program. So from emergency management with the city management, city manager, we did have one meeting so far, and we have become acquaint, acquainted with the smart 911 program. And based on what I can tell you right now, I will probably be referring to the superintendent and recommending that we do adopt it as well. Okay. So can we, we can get a report back on that? Absolutely. I think the, the, if you would give us the timeline being by mid September, that would be very reasonable for us to give you a report. Okay. Sounds good. Ms. Novick? Thank you, Mr. Chair. If it would be possible for um, to have included in the report what of that information we already effectively are either legally or by regulation required to share with emergency services. Um, I know that there's a number of requirements that the state puts on us already in terms of what our buildings um, need to share with things like the fire department. So I'd appreciate effectively knowing what we already do alongside what the proposal is. Thank you. We'll consult with the city manager through the city solicitor's office for that information. Yeah, report back then. Yeah. Would you say mid-September? Okay. Correct. Okay. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. To approve the job description for the special ed special uh, emotional learning specialist for the applied behavior uh, an analysis, analyst, um, ABA. I'll approve on the roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connell-Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. To approve the job description for the system-wide bilingual evaluator, teacher of moderate special needs. Roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connell-Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Okay. Request that the administration work with the, the Mayor, City Council, and others involved parties to address concerns related to the homeless population, the area of Lincoln Street School. We're going to refer that to the administration. Is Ms. Nova, is Ms. Molly on? I'm sorry. Is Molly McCullough on? No, I don't think so. I can't tell. Diana. I'm so dark. Okay, so we'll send that to the, uh, I know uh, Ms. McCullough had concerns with the school in that area. And, uh, Friday letter. Oh, Diana, okay, Diana. Okay, Ms. Mc, uh, Ms. Bean Carrier. Thank you. Um, what we were looking for is um, a report back in a Friday letter prior to August 11th with what action has already been taken regarding the situation and plans for the upcoming school year and also the ways the school committee can work with the city to assist that information can be shared with the school, the families, and the neighbors. So, okay, so I know the city, city manager is working on this and... Uh, right, which is an update on this prior to August 11th. Yeah, Ms. Uh, oh, yeah, through the chair. Um, I did receive, and I think the mayor may have too, an email today uh, asking that we attend the community meeting um, at the church across from uh, Lincoln Street School in August, right? Right, and that's why... Excuse me, Mia. Yeah. That's why the request is prior to August 11th in a Friday letter. Okay. So we could have the information prior to the so neighborhood meeting. Th through the chair, um, most of the things that are happening have nothing to do with Lincoln Street School, right? Uh, it has to all do with Oriole Drive and what's uh, happening there, and then people coming onto the school grounds with needles, right? It, it ha really has very little to do with what the school could do. Has, you know, I think it's a joint thing we have to discuss with the city. Yep. Right, and the, again, that's why we're asking. So we have a team working on this and some discussion and perhaps some solutions. Okay, so we'll send that. Thank you. We will send out to the administration. All those in favor, opposed, so what? Approve the job description for the grant contract specialist. Approve Mr. Chair. I'm probably doing so, Ms. Novick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, no um, concerns over the, the position itself, but uh, we are uh, approving a number of positions that came through in the budget um, and related to our sort of ongoing conversation around the federal funding. Um, when can we expect to see the jobs description for the ESSER program coordinator, which was an ad that came through 
um, in the in one of the rounds of the um, updates that we've gotten. Through, through the, the chair, um, I guess I'll do this one. <laughs> Um, so I just want to introduce to you Marco Andre. He's our new accountability and research manager, and um, we've had uh, several meetings. Uh, so uh, he might want to tell you a, a little bit about the new positions, uh, including uh, that we're putting an RFP for a company uh, to actually do the monitoring of, of the ESSA uh, grant funding. So uh, let me introduce Marco to you, and he can explain to you uh, what is the new positions in his office and what we're doing about monitoring the ESSA funds. Good evening. Welcome. Members of the board. Um, I'm Dr. Marco Andrade. Um, as uh, Superintendent has mentioned, I just started a few weeks ago. Um, with the ESSA funds, uh, we're looking to um, create an RFP to put out uh, a bid uh, to get a consulting firm uh, to come in and evaluate the services and the um, uh, uh, services and, um, excuse me, um, well, some of the work that will be happening through ESSER funding uh, to you know, be able to report back to the Fed and to, um, you know, make sure that uh, the services are meeting whatever deliverables we set. So thank you um, and welcome and I've been meaning to send you an email because you're actually the administrator for my subcommittee. Um, the, my under, and that sounds fine. My understanding though that part of what we were concerned about was literally the coordination of the programs that were gonna be running through ESSER and ensuring that that had oversight, that it wasn't only about the evaluation of um, whether or not those programs were particularly achieving particular kinds of goals. That sounds honestly a little bit more like what we probably should be doing through SOA. Um, so can someone explain to me what the change has, what, what, what triggered the change in terms of the idea here? And that may be a question for you or it may be a question for someone else in the administration. Dr. Amber? Yeah, I'm not sure about the, I'm sorry, I'm not sure about the coordinator. I know we've discussed the, uh, the position of trying to put out the bid, uh, the evaluation of the services that will be provided. So, so we are increasing some, so this is an accountability issue. So we are increasing the positions uh, in the Office of Research and Accountability. Uh, well, there'll, you know, there'll be a testing specialist, an evaluation specialist. There is also a position for the grant contract specialist. Uh, and all of this, because this SR is a coordination between um, finance, grants, and accountability. And so uh, we can actually address that if you want as a report at the next meeting. Well, really, thank you. Really, all I was looking for was, was what triggered the change because we had effectively a list of positions that we were looking to have added. Um, and I, I'm it's relieved positions. to hear that this office is being rebuilt because that's adding back positions they used to have. Um, in this particular concern, my, my concern though, honestly, and this is why I co-sponsored Ms. Biancaria's item um, just prior here, is um, we are a big enough system where it frequently makes more sense for us to hire people than to contract services out. Um, and this is a big enough issue that having that monitoring and oversight in-house um, struck me as being wise. That's why I didn't question that decision at the budget time. Um, so that's why I'm asking about that sort of change from it no longer being a position to now it being a contracted service. So in terms of the valuation, yeah. Um, in a circumstance like this, it's time limited. We have three years to work with mm -hmm. the ESSER funds um, for, I, I think, a number of reasons. It makes a lot of sense to try to work with a, uh, an agency uh, or institution that's just very familiar and has capacity to do a lot of the research and evaluation work. Uh, you know, we can work through them to um, set some deliverables, be crystal clear about what we want to see happening, uh, what we expect to get back, uh, and we can manage that. Uh, also, it just provides a little bit of support for us if the Fed happens to come back and say, uh, you know, how did you spend the funds? What did you do, you know, uh, in these areas? Uh, how do we know that things worked? And, um, you know, folks who will be coming in, again, with that expertise and um, not having to deal with some of the day-to-day -day work that would pop up that we'd have to be responding to inside of the office uh, is just more beneficial uh, for making sure that we, we hit the targets we have to hit. 
Um, okay, thank you. I suspect that you, you may potentially be defending a decision that you didn't make. Um, nonetheless, um, I, I'm, I'm going to reserve my, my um, judgment on this one. I, I think that, that the earlier proposal probably was better, um, but I w certainly will support this position. Okay, thank so you. we will do it on a roll, roll call. Roll call. Yeah, Gary? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor-Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. To accept the CVTE uh, Student Support Impact and Recovery Grant in the amount of $60,000 to the Worcester Technical High School, effective from July 1st, 21 to June 30th, 2022. Roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor-Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Um, to accept the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center STEM Equipment and uh, Professional Development Program, grant an amount of $188,548.02, which includes the funding for equipment and professional development, effective uh, July 1st, 2021, and June 30th, 2022. Roll call. Mr. Chair? Yeah. Just very briefly, um, I did want to just note this is elementary school hands-on labs, which is one of the giant holes that I think that we have. So this is fantastic. I'm really glad to see this. Thank you. Okay, roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor-Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Uh, next is to consider the Worcester uh, Teacher Pipeline recommendations for diversifying retained teachers for, uh, of color, a comprehensive uh, proposal. I just want to thank, uh, the reason I put this on here so the school committee members can have a chance to look at it, and I know you probably, could, I think we sent it to you anyways, but, uh, and, uh, but I just want to thank Barry Maloney and uh, Ray Lewis from Mississippi State University and all the volunteers, and in the report it lists all the people involved, all the colleges that were involved, um, Worcester State, Clark, Assumption, Holy Cross, Quinsigamon, and uh, Hildo Ramirez, it was probably her idea running back uh, a few years ago to, to get this done, if I remember right. So I want to thank Hilda Ramirez also. And, uh, you know, it does talk about uh, diversifying the workforce, which we talked earlier tonight about. And uh, we just need to figure that out. Every city, in, I think, in the country is probably facing the same issue. And I uh, just want to thank the superintendent and her staff who participated. I know she's supportive of this. And, uh, um, and also, there's not about diversifying, but how about retention is important, too, the report talks about. And also talks about residency, uh, mentors, and uh, making sure that as, as children, as especially the young people who go through the system, get them into, it's a good career teaching, I think, and, uh, um, and, and it's hard, it's not easy, that's for sure. But, uh, but it's a, I think it's a rewarding career, and uh, so I think this is an important report. So I just asked the administration in the form of a motion as to maybe where are we with this report, you know, what do you need to do, and some of it, it's going to take, this, this is years in the making, so it's going to take some time to get there. So maybe on strategically how we move forward and how we can answer some of the issues, get a detailed report uh, addressing this. And I think we'll send this, I think the governance is the, yeah. What's that? I was going to oh, say, sorry, it seems like it should go to a yeah. subcommittee yeah, um, so that, that we can keep an eye on it. Yep. I mean, it's, sorry, it's no. hiring, which is sort of governance. It's data, so it's sort of student, I mean, it's operations, so arguments of no. I mean, it could be any of those. Okay. Um, Mr. Monfredo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I certainly uh, uh, enjoy the, reading the report and something that, uh, that we have discussed in the past, and I discussed it with uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, Dr. Ray Lewis at Worcester State University. Um, on page 54 of the report, it talks about what we're doing as a, as a system with our future teachers on club and with our IAs becoming gone teachers, and it was good to see, uh, see that was a part of the report. And the recommendations for uh, future, uh, future growth certainly was well done. I'd like to add that uh, we need to, uh, and add, as a Worcester State, I'm sorry, as, uh, as we do at uh, Worcester Public Schools, add that we actively need to recruit students by talking to them one-on-one -on -one with their parents about the merits of uh, teaching as a profession. Uh, and also how we're going to be helping them uh, helping their students. In expanding uh, the uh, summer future program as uh, was suggested in the report. Uh, 
So in a motion, I, I'd like a report uh, to recommend that we get a report back next July as where we are with, uh, with the program. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Morfredo. So we'll send that to governance. In my motion, so. I'm sorry, I missed your motion. Yeah, the well, yeah, motion was that uh, uh, we get the report back next July as where we are with the program. Okay, and uh, maybe also my re request too, we get a report back how we're going to address all the issues. I think the you worked so hard on it, and uh, that I think the whole committee it was number of, it had to be 30 people, 40 people that they'd probably like to see we're taking it seriously and where we're going. Yeah, we're what's great. All those in favor, opposed, so ordered. Okay. To approve uh, prior fiscal year payment in the total amount of $1,816.38 to, to caregivers for transportation. Roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. To approve a prior fiscal year payment in the amount of $1,409.60 to FW Web Company, Inc., Roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Approve a five fiscal year payment in the amount of $1,415.25 to another security agency, Inc. Roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor Yes. And Mayor Petty. Yes. Mr. Chair, yep. did, did you miss it? Just making sure you get 1-191. Uh, I missed that. Okay. Oh, yes, I did. Yep. To accept the career technical initiative planning grant in the amount of $10,000, effective June 15, 2021, to August 31st, 2021. Roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Okay, to approve a prior fiscal year payment in the amount of $1,415.25 to Archer Security Agency, Inc., a roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Yes. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. To approve a um, prior fiscal year payment in the amount of $2,199.53 to Pearson, Inc., uh, roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Mr. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. To prove uh, the following donations, with the Academy from the Boys, um, what does that say? Box tops. Box tops. Boys Tops of Education, and also from, to Woodland Academy from Trinity Church of Northborough to be used for uniforms, and also the Worcester Public Schools from uh, Blackboard giving fund on behalf of AbbVie's. Roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Uh, to consider a prior fiscal year payment in the amount of uh, $108.08 .08 for the uh, mileage reimbursement of, to a staff for the English We're in a program, a roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Excuse me. Yes. Ms. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Monfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Uh, to consider naming the dual language school at the former St. Stephen's School. Um, Ms. Menenda? Want to talk about that? I'll go and send that to committee anyways, but go ahead. And to the committee? Yeah. That's what so, uh, the only problem is that until we give a school a name, we cannot get a designation from DESE. So there, it's holding up our uh, designation as a school assignment of data until the school has a, has a name. Um, so if it could come in and out of committee quick. So you want us to pass this tonight? You can do that. Uh, I'm just wondering if people are comfortable doing that. I am. I just set the committee on here, so. Okay. <laughs> So we can vote that tonight. Is there any problem with it? Or? Nope. Mr. Morfredo? Uh, would uh, school committee and administration consider naming the school the uh, Worcester Dual Language Academy and name the school auditorium after Emanuel uh, uh, Fetima Auditorium or whatever is in that school with a write-up about this fallen hero and how he represents the vision of our dual language uh, school uh, and how he pursued his education, career, and personal life. 
and his role uh, as a model uh, in this community? Just a thought. And yeah, we can send that to the administration, but I think the school's gonna be called La Familia, which represents family, which is a familiar family, correct? Or is that it's about, so either, I mean, either way, I was just giving yeah. another suggestion. On recommendation of the right. advisory board that I was working on, it was La Familia dual language school, meaning the family at the center. So it's not just for, in honor of the police officer, but it's the Put for all families. And then if we wanted to have a plaque inside, certainly um, that would be nice to have. There's not an auditorium in St. Stephen's, but um, inside the main door or something would be great to have a Any of the office door. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry that. Okay. So we're going to pass this tonight. A roll call. Thank you. No, go ahead. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy. Yes. Mr. Poli. Yes. Ms. McCullough. Mr. Monfredo. Yes. Ms. O'Connor-Novick. Yes. And Mayor Petty. Yes. Approve a prior fiscal year payment amount of seven hundred seventy-one dollars and eighty-four cents to Zendesk Inc. Roll call. Ms. Biancaria. Yes. Mrs. Clancy. Yes. Mr. Poli. Yes. Ms. McCullough. Mr. Monfredo. Yes. Ms. O'Connor-Novick. Yes. And Mayor Petty. Yes. Okay, next is the okay, we're gonna, the motion is going to the executive session. We will not be returning to open session. Um, oh, we might have to do a couple of contracts. Okay, we might be, okay, we're gonna say we're returning to open session. We have a couple of contracts that might have to be signed off on tonight. So, uh, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and to conduct collective bargaining regarding grievance 2221-11. Uh, discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the following items on the bargaining uh, position of the public body. And the chair so declares, so I so, so declare on all the following items. Uh, successor contract negotiations, Massachusetts Laborers District uh, Council for on behalf of the Worcester Public Services Employees Local 272 and Laborers uh, International Union of North America, AFL-CIO custodians. Massachusetts Laborers District Council for on behalf of the Worcester Public Schools Employees Local Union 272 and the Laborers International Union of North America, AFL-CIO, Educational Secretaries of Massachusetts Laborers District Council for on behalf of the Worcester Public Schools Employees Local Union 272 and the Laborers International Union of North America, AFL-CIO, Unit D, Computer Technicians. To discuss strategy with respect to collective buying if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect and uh, on the sixth of contract negotiations, the International Union of Public Employees, Plumbers, Steamfitters, Local 125, International Union of Public Employees, Tradesmen, Local 135. And also success of contract negotiations, Education Association of Worcester, Units A and B, Teachers and Administrators. And success of contract negotiations, Education Association of Worcester, Instructional Assistance Unit. And education, and also uh, Education Association of Worcester and Worcester School Committee, American uh, Arbitration Association, case number 0120-0015-2596, elimination of extra time at the level of four school at level four schools. Uh, education Association of Worcester and the Worcester School Committee, grievance 20-21-09, class action grievance uh, not being paid while in quarantine due to COVID to discuss strategy with respect to litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the public party. On behalf of the Worcester Public Schools, on the Massachusetts Laborers District Council, and for the uh, half of, behalf of the Worcester Public Schools, on Police Local Union 272, of the Laborers International Union of uh, North America, AFL-CIO, Custodian, Worcester School Committee, grievance uh, payment or regarding payment of employees during quarantine period. Okay, and successor contract negotiation, Education Association of Worcester, Worcester Public Schools of Parent Liaison Association, and also to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel to conduct collective bargaining uh, sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel superintendent of schools. So the motion is going to executive session. We'll return to open session. Sean Sweeney's been pretty busy, I guess, so. Uh, Roll call. Ms. Biancaria. She go. Uh, Mrs. Clancy. Yes. Mr. Foley. Yes. Ms. McCullough. Mr. Monfredo. Yes. Ms. O'Connor-Novick. Yes. And Mayor Petty. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. 
Okay, welcome back to the Worcester School Committee. Uh, roll call. Recording in progress. Ms. Bianca Area. Here. Mrs. Clancy. Here. Mr. Foley. Here. Ms. McCullough. Mr. Monfredo. Here. Ms. O'Connell Here. And Mayor Petty. Here. So we have two actions in the executive session. Pursuant to action taken in the executive session, it was moved to ratify the memorandum agreement between the Worcester School Committee and the Massachusetts Laborers District Council for and on behalf of the Worcester Public um, Services Employees, Local Union 272 of the Laborers, International Union of North America, AFL-CIO, Unit D, Computer Technicians. And uh, this would be effective for the uh, between the periods of July 1st, 2020 through June 30th of 2021. Roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Manfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connell-Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Second one is pursuant to action taken in the executive session. It was moved to ratify the memorandum of agreement between the Worcester School Committee in the Massachusetts Labor District Council for on behalf of the Swiss Public Services Employees, Local Union 272, the Labor's International Union of North America, AFL-CIO custodians, effective for the uh, periods between July 1st, 2020 and June 30th, 2021. Roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Mr. Manfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor-Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. So is that it? That's it. Yes, thank so you. We do a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Oh, uh, well, Molly's not thinking to do a roll call. Roll call. Ms. Biancaria? Yes. Mrs. Clancy? Yes. Mr. Pope? Yes. Ms. McCullough? Ms. DeMonfredo? Yes. Ms. O'Connor-Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Okay. Judy, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> we owe you one. And that's what. Yeah, but I have to pick them up.